I, I want to be held accountable for what I'm doing. You know, this may sound like an, an exaggeration, but it was like the 9-11 of my career and certainly of making kombucha. Jesus is smart. This idea of income inequality, that always strikes me as a very, it's a deceptive term, income inequality. Well, let's flip it around. It comes from outcome inequality. In five, four, three, two. I got the loot, Steve! Hello, welcome back to Grubstakers, the podcast about billionaires. My name is Sean P. McCarthy, and I'm joined today by all of my co-hosts. Yogi Poyle. Andy Palmer. Steve Jeffers. And so this week, we wanted to take a, a deep look at the Bank of Credit and Commerce, which I think is one of the greatest scandals in American political history that's almost unknown today. You know, I mean, maybe it's just my own ignorance, but I only learned about the Bank of Credit and Commerce just incidentally doing research for this podcast. Right. We did the the Mafuz family episode about the Saudi Arabian billionaires, and I learned about the Bank of Credit and Commerce through that. And... Um, the bank, yeah. No way this scandal's bigger than the Janet Jackson nipplegate of Super Bowl uh, 41, I believe. Right. Well, what I would argue to you is I think Iran-Contra is a bigger scandal than Watergate. Mm -hmm. And yet Iran-Contra, people have heard it, but they don't really know what it was for the most part, You know, myself included until recently. Right. I think BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, is an even bigger scandal than Iran-Contra. So these two scandals that are that are so much bigger than Watergate, you know, why are they so not talked about today? Why are the, the, the effects of them, which we are still feeling, why are they not part of our political discussion? Um, and, you know, I have a couple... Well, of course, neither of these compares to the uh, enormous uh, Russiagate conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a couple theories, because uh, Iran-Contra, of course, takes place under the uh, Ronald Reagan administration, and uh, George H.W. Bush was part of it, and the very same thing happens with BCCI. This is Sarah Kenzier from Gaslit Nation, and you're listening to Mueller She Wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, we got acquired. It's a whole thing that we're dealing with here, but uh, we got to play this every 15 minutes now. Yeah. Well, uh, so Robert Mueller, wa Mueller was actually part of the BCCI scandal in that he was part of the Justice Department as the assistant attorney general, and his job was to go on television and say, no, there's not a cover-up here. <laughs> we just didn't look into this shit for like 20 years, 15 years. Uh, so at best... Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Robert Mueller's role, but at best his role was uh, following orders to pretend there is nothing wrong here. Well, that's what a good... Uh, that's completely yeah. uncharacteristic of, uh, you know, how he handled, let's say, uh, anthrax <laughs> or... Um, but so... Everything he, else he had to investigate? The brief uh, summary of Bank of Credit and Commerce International, it was originally a Pakistani bank that became an international bank, uh, but then in 1991, it was indicted by Robert Morgenthau, the uh, Manhattan district attorney. Mm -hmm. It went bankrupt, and it was indicted for being a giant fraud Ponzi scheme, stealing billions of dollars of depositor money, being involved in arms trading all over the world, um, you know, also child trafficking, drug trading, uh, terrorism, uh, being a front, uh, having accounts for the CIA, the Mossad, uh, Pakistani intelligence. It was often called. Well, that's just uh, securing uh, our, our world from terrorists. Yeah. Uh, BCCI was often said it was like uh, one and the same with Pakistani intelligence, the ISI, for uh, its entire existence. Right. And so in 1991, it collapses, you know, again, $20 billion bank, at the time the seventh largest bank in the world. And then um, so what we go through is that, you know, uh, various officials in the Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush administration kind of covered up for this. They kept it from being investigated. They, uh, you know, lo quote unquote, lost memos that were sent up the chain about, hey, this is a giant fraud or, oh, this is terrorism, uh, terrorist funding, you know. So why is it that this huge scandal of the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administration is not talked about today by Democrats? Well, I might have two audio drops that might uh, maybe shed some light on why that is. Okay, here it goes. Bazinga. <laughs> <laughs> Was that it? Yes, the uh, the young Sheldon BCCI <laughs> oh, connection. Oh, young Sheldon, okay. <laughs> if it's funny, it's bazinga. <laughs> Interesting. Is young Sheldon still on? 
Uh, it, he was part of the BCCI blackmail <laughs> scandal. <laughs> so he actually has tapes of um, CBS executives with dancing girls in the Lahore. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So they can't take it off the air. I, I learned to code and I made us a, a new drops player. And now I have them all at my fingertips. And so there we have a whole set of drops that we're going to play. Uh, but at the same time... In the land of wonder, the land down under. <laughs> and perhaps most impressive of all the men seen with Abed, a former president of the United States, Jimmy Carter. Carter flew around the world with Abed, with millions of dollars from BCCI to promote good works in the third world. The Bank of Credit and Commerce is unique among all the banks that I've ever dealt with. They are a major sponsors. Mr. Carter may not have known it, but he became BCCI's most important ambassador. And law enforcement authorities now say BCCI used Carter's trips to Africa to further its larger, grander scheme. Which the dial the payroll is primary, lead shareholder, and financial general in Washington, D.C. Now, maybe that's coincidence. And now, BCCI's political connections have become an issue in the 1992 presidential campaign. A major financial backer of Democratic frontrunner Bill Clinton has long-standing ties to BCCI. Multimillionaire Jackson Stevens brokered a deal through which BCCI secretly gained control of the National Bank of Georgia. And Stevens assisted in BCCI's initial takeover attempt of First American. Bazinga. Stevens also helped to raise funds for another firm linked to BCCI, the Harkin Energy Corporation. President Bush's son, George, sits on the board of Harkin Energy. My dad. The Bush campaign is Bazinga. also under scrutiny for its BCCI links. James Lake, the president's deputy campaign manager, Sean's mad about has Bazinga. come under fire for his public relations contract with BCCI's new owner, Sheikh Zayed of Abu Dhabi. Lake has called the charges of impropriety preposterous. It is impossible not to question the propriety of the President of the United States' campaign being managed by someone who is simultaneously being paid over $200,000 every three months to represent BCCI's biggest shareholder. As the probes of the connections between BCCI's corruption and American politics intensify, it is difficult to predict where it will all end. But so you heard um, Bill Cl uh, Jimmy Carter call it uh, BCCI unique among banks that he has ever dealt with. Mm -hmm. You know, unique. Not not every bank will uh, secretly film senators having sex with children uh, trafficked from Lahore. Uh, so you heard Jimmy Carter praise BCCI as unique among banks he's dealt with. Uh, he went on. Seems all like something we should revisit in a, a second. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we will get to that. You heard uh, Jimmy Carter describe BCCI as unique among banks he's dealt with. Uh, according to the book The Outlaw Bank by Jonathan Beatty and S.C. Gwynn, uh, they were former Time magazine correspondents. They said that... Uh, oh, do they do the one on whether angels are real? <laughs> uh, they said that BCCI gave at least $10 million to Carter, Jimmy Carter's charitable efforts. So... Whether or not Carter was a knowing participant, when you're flying around the world with this bank as your charitable arm and taking money from it, people will say, oh, that's a trustworthy bank. President Jimmy Carter, he's a nice guy. Right, he works right. with that bank. We should put our money in there. And then suddenly, you know, 15 or 18 billion of deposits is just gone because Jimmy Carter went around and said, yeah, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International is unique. Put your money in there. Um, and then the second drop was, of course, Bill Clinton. Uh, Jackson T. Stevens is a Arkansas. He's dead now, but a, a billionaire. His son is a billionaire. He was an Arkansas businessman, one of the uh, early f uh, funders of Walmart, who put a bunch of money into Bill Clinton's presidential campaign, who was also heavily linked to BCCI, who helped uh, BCCI get their uh, front company bank set up in the United States of America. So why is the BCCI scandal not talked about the way Watergate is. Well, maybe it's the fact that Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton are also implicated in it. <laughs> so you've got Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, all just knee-deep in this shit. And, uh... Sean, these guys like white people problems, okay, man? <laughs> I don't know what you're bringing this all this up for. 
But I guess what I wanted to do today is go kind of on a deep dive on this, what I do think is of the 20th century, one of the greatest scandals in American politics. And I want to spend time and we're going to divide this into a two part or at least we might do a third part if we have to, because I don't want to uh, have to skip anything. But That's a threat to the audience. By <laughs> the way. Yeah, we'll do a third part if we have to. <laughs> If you really ask for it, we'll do a fourth part as well. We, yeah. we might not have anything to say about it at that point, but you know what? Four hours of BCCI content. We'll pull this podcast over, and you will not be allowed to go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we listen to the listeners, and uh, we know you don't want to hear about BCCI's involvement in child sex trafficking or blackmail or the CIA. This is going to be about the Forex market. <laughs> this is going to be about Cayman Islands. Yes. This is going to be about leverage ratios. Oh, yeah. This is a deep financial That's dive right. on mm-hmm. BCCI mm-hmm. with nothing salacious nope. Nope. for four <laughs> hours. Right. Four-parter on the finances of BCCI. More boring well, than C-SPAN. Well, on to this. <laughs> Sean, why are you hard? <laughs> <laughs> well, suck. Well, on, well, suck. Yes. Suck. on, on, well, this. suck. Well, well, suck on on this. <laughs> Andy, you can't do that and then get mad when people complain about you on Reddit. Well, suck on this. I was only mad because the uh, post production drops were being conflated with me. Well, yes, it's on me. Well, well, well suck, suck on on this. this. Um, but so we'll divide this into kind of part one. It'll be uh, what you're listening to now on the free side, part two, and if necessary, part three on the paywall. And, you know, if you have any, if, if you're upset about that, just to be clear, part two will be all of the libel. So it is sure. for our own safety that right. that is behind the paywall because with uh, BCCI, you have what is, you know, very much known in public, but you do have a lot of other links, very possibly to Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, which we'll get to. Where, Who's that? Yeah. <laughs> where there's no way of, at least with the information we have now, there's no way of proving it, but there's so much smoke that there has to be, you know, something going on that's right. more than what we know. And it is just kind of mind-blowing with BCCI because all of these books, all of these TV specials, we played t- uh, you a Frontline and an NBC News report from, I think, 1992. Mm-hmm. All of this talk in 92, 93 was about BCCI. And then you try to look nothing since right, then right. just complete radio silence what i love about that that frontline episode it's on youtube i i highly suggest checking it out uh partially for you know the the whole finance whatever but also because uh in the 90s they talked differently than they do now and you don't realize <laughs> it until about 30 years later and then and then it really starts to stand out and that they, they they have all these uh just like things that you um the sum total of this committee's investigation is that you have been in bed with bcci for at least 10 years you're telling us all you got was a back rub <laughs> <laughs> nowadays it's different yeah, nowadays yeah no one would ever talk about uh our senators are so uh, boring compared to that yeah. no one yeah. ever speak figuratively about a back rub no today. no no <laughs> god no yeah sounds like i don't speak. even like back rubs i'll take your back rubs I was doing a Dershowitz thing. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like he needs to study a PUA escalation techniques. <laughs> you know, if you're in bed with somebody and you can't escalate from a back rub, like, you got to take my course for forty nine ninety nine a month <laughs> <laughs> for the $15 patrons who do our <laughs> PUA episodes. <laughs> we the all Sean have, McCarthy method. <laughs> <laughs> we all have uh, pickup artist names. I'm Destiny. I'm, I'm the, the outlaw bank. <laughs> I'm drops. <laughs> Yo, you want to get what? your dick game up? You got to talk to drops. <laughs> we uh, we all show up in flowing Middle Eastern turbans, <laughs> and that's that's peacock that's, game because yeah. no one else in the that's club. Right. Mm-hmm. There are no other white mm-hmm. people yeah. in the club. Dr- dressed like sheiks. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what. Once you get the Kino going, you look in your you look right in her eyes and you say bazinga. <laughs> We don't go to clubs. We go to bingo halls to pick up <laughs> chicks. Trust me, when they say D9, it's going to be mine, if you know what I mean. But so, when we talk about BCCI, there's so we'll many... We'll talk more about how to get pussy at the bingo clubs in the bonus. <laughs> but I guess with BCCI, there's so many different rabbit holes we could go down. Again, this is linked to uh, arms trafficking, child trafficking, drug trafficking, money laundering, uh, bribery, assassinations, intelligence gathering. Incidentally, uh, they didn't uh, contribute to traffic in general, though. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but what I wanted to... A lot of public transportation. Mm-hmm. 
the the thing that most concerns me about BCCI is uh, the Central Intelligence Agency uh, and its 67% approval rating among the American <laughs> public. Like, they did a survey. It's something like 67% of Americans approve of the Central Intelligence Jesus Agency. Christ. And it's just one of those things where it's and like... That's after they stopped giving people acid. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where this only happens because people don't know. Like, they don't know about Iran-Contra, that they were running fucking rape genocide squads all, the, all throughout Central and South America, and they don't know about BCCI where they're probably at least uh, partly linked to child trafficking. Well, don't and know. They can't even look it up. Like you're mentioning, it's been like a washed off the internet in so many ways. And I mean, even these drops and these videos we found, the front line's on YouTube. Right. But the, ni the 92 uh, NBC footage, I had to clean up the audio bit because it's from like a VHS copy of the goddamn footage. Right. So it's, you know, it, it's being deleted off the web as it is, let alone people having knowledge of it. They can't even fucking find it. But there are I Wikipedia pages of like uh, CIA-linked activity to South American dictatorships mm -hmm. coming to power. And oh, like yeah. You can just go and visit the wiki for the CIA coups and right, right. backed coups in Chile. Wikipedia is actually pretty decent for, um, find, for like, classified information getting leaked um, or just, like, hard-to-find things. Like, they have trouble taking it down because, like, to take it down because it's classified, you have to admit it's classified. But it's well, happened on the uh, podcast before where like we've we've looked up shit and then I found like older articles that link stuff from a Wikipedia that's now been cleaned that's not on the Wikipedia. I mean, you're right. right. It's better than certainly previous uh, ways to have information. But I mean, it's all the billionaire class is certainly monitoring what information about them is on the Internet, if not billionaire uh, industries that need to be cleaned as well. It's hence the case with BCCI. And mm -hmm. what's really what's really annoying with um like the whole, you know, Americans love the CIA thing. As I was talking to someone recently about like Valerie Plame and how, you know, she's running this kind of bullshit. I, right, I was a right. badass CIA agent campaign. And the person I was talking to was like, uh, and I was talking about all the like shit that the CIA's done. Mm -hmm. And the person I was talking to was like, well, I mean, you don't know that Valerie Plame's done that. I mean, she, what she did was <laughs> stuff for <laughs> national security. Right, and it's right. like, Name what she's actually done for national security. I mean, it's classified. Of course. So you can't actually name, like, either the good or the bad things that, like, the CIA actually does. Well, the way I look at it is the same way, like, when I remember growing up, if you went to, like, New York or Washington, D.C., you would come back with, like, a NYPD or FBI merch, you know? Right. Like, that was, like, a common oh, yeah. thing to buy. And, you know, you look at now with, like, the, the fair uh, beating of the, I mean, the fair, uh, what the fuck it's called, the, the cops in the subways right now because the the being the fair, oh yeah fair the, enforcement yeah, yeah fair enforcement like you know they got a guy who's in a fucking subway and they're like we thought he had a gun but also we knew that he jumped the turnstile so we had 15 cops on him to like it's like it doesn't make any so fucking sounds sense. like a fair beating to me <laughs> <laughs> but i mean like in the same vein like you know we look at you these, get what you deserve <laughs> <laughs> these you know Officials of authority, like they are uh, doing a only a good service for the citizens of the world, if not at least this country. But the reality is that's not the case. Well, that's what I would say is with the CIA, the people who know about it and still approve of it, I think what you'll find from some of them is, yeah, the CIA did bad things in the past, but that's all over now. <laughs> right. But what I want to emphasize with Iran-Contra and BCCI, again, this is the mid-80s through the early 90s, what I want to emphasize here is that the people at the CIA involved in those are the ones leading the CIA today. Right, of course. Like, nobody got fired or arrested for this shit. Like, there were the Iran-Contra prosecutions where they were pardoned by George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush. But the thing is, these organizations... It's the same fucking people right, of course. at the end of the day. So that's why they are so relevant, and it's why it's very disturbing that it's not talked about, where you know, Richard Nixon is a corrupt crook, but Ronald Reagan is praised by Democrats, mm -hmm. when by all accounts, I mean, they're both bad guys, but you know, Reagan is not some uh, uh, honorable man who did the right thing. He ran a fucking genocide in South and Central America, and he ran weapons... Uh, to both sides of the Iran-Iraq war in, in a very horrible war. Yeah. But what a run, though. You yes. Know? <laughs> Maybe but that's I mean, why they like him. They're like, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with what they did, but they did it so well. <laughs> yeah, it, it's Edward Snowden talks. They appreciate um, the effort. Mm -hmm. uh, talks uh, pretty eloquently about how, like, many intelligence operations from his view on the inside, and of course he can talk freely because, you know, as long as he's uh, uh, indicted for 
uh, treason. You know, he's got nothing to lose in terms of saying everything that he saw on the inside. Right. Um, it, from his perspective, like a lot of the uh, spying apparatus uh, in the NSA, but also in the CIA, it's just to maintain American interests, which means it doesn't mean the interests of like the average American person. It's American business interests. Of course. Like the, the and that's kind of the dirty secret of um, <clears throat> the American intelligence community is it's not about stopping terrorism or, um, you know, I, I would argue all figures of authority. I, I completely agree with you, but I think, yeah, I think everything from the FBI to CIA to the government itself to even cops on the street, they're protecting property, not rights. Exactly. Yeah. But so, and you know, again, there's a lot of things we can go down with BCCI, but something I find fascinating is that it really predates the modern multinational corporation where BCCI is best understood as a sovereign nation state. It's the anarcho-capitalist dream mm -hmm. where BCCI literally had their own intelligence service called the Black Network where according to, be black? <laughs> <laughs> according to the outlaw bank it had about 1500 employees and these are secret agents and you know we'll go through it a little bit more but they talk about how they were doing blackmail operations. They were doing assassinations for the CIA. Mm -hmm. They were doing assassinations for BCCI. Of course, you know, extortion, threatening people, gathering intelligence, all this stuff. Um, wow, secret Asians doing blackmail for a black network, Sean? Come on, what, mm -hmm. a, what, what is this? The CIA want POC to take all the blame? <laughs> How do you become secret Asian? Secret Asian? Uh, listen, there's a whole process, <laughs> but trust me, it's worth it. <laughs> is that what that eyelid surgery is about? <laughs> Yeah, you know, the feet binding thing, similar, very similar. <laughs> but, you know, so it really presages a lot of modern, uh, the modern corporation, but also the offshore, the money laundering thing. Uh, the, the book, The Outlaw Bank, it ends by pointing out, this book was written in 1993, it ends by pointing out that if the law was reformed with regards to the Cayman Islands as a um, tax secrecy state, if mm -hmm. the United States just said, hey, any uh, government that opts that operates as a tax shelter, as a tax secrecy jurisdiction, right. if they just say that you cannot have any of your money throw through the flow through the United States, they would have to reform those laws immediately. Do we know if people actually live on the Cayman Islands or if it's just a bunch of like folders that say that have the names of companies? Yeah. Just in a building. <laughs> well, the funny thing about the Cayman Islands is everyone pretends the billions that flow in there every year are just like to buy fucking umbrellas for the beach <laughs> and like sandals. That's yeah. so great. Like I spent 17 billion on just sandals for my uh, beach visit. This is Cabana Futures. <laughs> <laughs> but it is something where, so what happened uh, in a nutshell with the BCI theft is they set up a Cayman Islands holding company that owned the actual company. The Cayman Islands does not have to report any tax information or any corporate information to any tax authority anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. They set up this uh, Cayman Islands holding company and then billions of dollars flow through the Cayman Islands and disappear. You know, so billions of dollars of depositor money uh, was just stolen straight out and mm -hmm. divert it for, again, intelligence operations, bribery, everything else. Um, There's one in the, Luxembourg, too. I think. Right, yeah. They the set smaller up, one. They set up their first company in Luxembourg, and then they set up another holding company in Cayman Islands, mm -hmm. which is how, like, these shells work. We were talking about... Like, we're the suckers. We set up our podcast LLC in New York State <laughs> when what we should be doing and will do is incorporate it in Delaware right. and then get a Cayman Islands holding mm -hmm. company mm -hmm. and then Grubstakers yeah. will not pay any taxes. <laughs> well, I mean, we were considering having the holding company be in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Right. But what with the Brexit shit going down, I mean, so know, much uncertainty. We just want to be oh, safe. Yeah. And Delaware yeah. is a safer we option. We need to safeguard our assets. All I know is I want to have at least 10 different holding companies. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start in Delaware. Then we're going to Ireland. Then we're going to Luxembourg. <laughs> then we're going to Cayman Islands. The ultimate irony would be all of us becoming billionaires <laughs> due to all of the research we've done on these fucking billionaires. We'd pay like 10000 more setting up the holding companies than we ever would have in taxes. <laughs> and it turns out our real money maker is a shell company that just literally sells uh, drops. seashells. <laughs> yeah. Turns Sell out drops. those get really big. It becomes like uh, tulips in, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the Netherlands. That's right, yeah. <laughs> But it's like, you know, I guess on the surface level of the BCI scan BCCI scandal, they, you know, they did money laundering laundering for Pablo Escobar's Medellin cartel. But, you know, cocaine smuggling is the least interesting thing they were involved in. <laughs> I do like their their uh 
like fraud model of just like, yeah, yeah, I'll hold your money for you and then just stealing it. <laughs> <laughs> like you think it's going to be money. like this complicated, like, you know, there, for all the layers of like shell companies, right, right. it's just like, yeah, no, just you can trust me with your money and then just like leaving with it. That's Well, the BCCI business model is really fascinating to me because it's like, they figured out who you're allowed to steal from because BCCI, and we'll get to this in just a second here, they set up in the Gulf states where um, with all the oil money, there's a lot of Pakistani migrant workers who go to the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They all need to send remittances back home to Pakistan. So BCCI becomes their bank of choice. Uh, So they get all that money and it's like, okay, migrant workers. Yes, you can definitely steal from Mm -hmm. them. Uh, the Medellin cartel. Oh, oh. No, you cannot <laughs> steal from them. All of the yeah, people who, business. all of the people who Carter mentions as being like, "Wow, BCCI is what a fascinating solution of the market." This right. is. Mm-hmm. Those are people who you can steal from. Yeah, um, and you know, and so we'll get to the American uh, and uh, let's say European as well aspect of this. But we've talked about it a fair bit when it comes to you know the looting in the post-Soviet Ukraine and Russia where uh, London and New York City and Washington, D.C. are all intimately involved in this. So what I wanted to point out, uh, just one more thing to start here, is that Ernst & Young and PricewaterhouseCooper were the auditors of the books of BCCI mm-hmm. for, again, like more than a decade, from like 78 to 91. Um, and it is something where, uh, well, they both, they paid a, a $175 million fine in 1998 but again, this is what fifteen. Got him. Fifteen billion, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> fifteen billion dollars go missing, and price. And these are two of the big four accounting firms, and they both like look at the books and say, "Yep, everything seems straight here. We didn't notice fifteen billion dollars." Right. And it's you know uh, the American account, the American and British accounting firms are happy to collect their check to just look the other way. It's like when you. That's the equivalent of if you successfully dispute like. A a late charge on your on your checking account. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and uh, uh, in addition to being, let's say, a nation state in and of itself, BCCI. I'll, uh, I think to start this, I'll just talk very briefly about Iran Contra, and then we'll kind of go through chronological of BCCI. Yo, I love that Sean's like, we'll start this, and it's, we're fucking twenty nine minutes <laughs> into this fucking episode already. <laughs> I guess we should get started. Yeah, though. and now to begin our show. Yeah. <laughs> Well, wait, uh, Sean. Let me know when we're going to uh, the Middle East. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Um, so after all the bazinga drops, mm-hmm. yes. we'll start this with. Uh, <laughs> but so I guess just to say a couple other things, BCCI served as an intermediary for different nation states that couldn't be seen doing business together. Iran Contra was fundamentally. Um, various Americans are taken hostage in Lebanon, and then, uh, of course, the U.S. government does negotiate with terrorists all the time. Uh, uh, Hezbollah and Iran uh, have a deal going where the U.S. says, okay, we'll send, you know, tow missiles and other weapons to Iran in exchange, release the hostages and, you know, give us money. And then they send that money to the Contras because they can keep it, they can hide it from from Congress. Um, But, you know, BCCI serves as an intermediary where the weapons sent to Iran were actually sent from Israel to Iran, but for both the leaders of Israel and Iran, they can't be seen to be doing business together, so BCCI is the intermediary. They allow all this stuff to happen, and in exchange, you know, various nations look the other way at other shit BCCI is doing. Um, it is it is very funny how after uh, Watergate, uh, with all the, the revelations about the wrongdoing of the CIA, the Church Committee, and all that, mm-hmm. Congress was like, we're going to cut your money, and the CIA like then got to cut it, and they're like, so what do you guys say about uh, selling uh, drugs and weapons? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, uh, you know, make some bread? I mean, it's, pr- it's a pretty standard practice, like, hey, if you take a kid's toys away, he will find something else to play with. Yeah, yeah. So, fun story, uh, jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, the current Attorney General of the United States, William Barr, who just so happened to be in charge of the ju- Justice Department when Epstein was, quote-unquote, suicided, <laughs> the current uh, Attorney General... Uh, he they're was. Gonna, they're going to release those video, uh, the results of the video camera analysis any day now. <laughs> we're going to find out about uh, what those guards were up to, the guards who uh, did not work at the prison and were just <laughs> substitute <laughs> teachers, apparently. Uh, but yeah, so William Barr worked at the CIA from 1971 to 1977. He worked for the CIA, and part of his job there was stonewalling the church committee. <laughs> and, you know, another hopeful 
uh, hopefully a theme of this episode will be the Senate and the Congress has really no ability to impact oversight. Mm-hmm. Of, They've stopped now. Yeah, of the CIA. They just don't care. Right, like, yes, they they really haven't tried. Like, they did the thing with torture after uh, that came out where the CIA was literally going through their garbage and spying on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Yeah. Still no prosecutions. Oh, yeah, and then the CIA was like, hey, how about you uh, don't release any of this to the public? And Feinstein was like, okay. <laughs> But so, a uh, fun story about William Barr. At the CIA from 1971 to 1977, becomes attorney general uh, for the end of George H.W. Bush's term uh, in 1992, becomes attorney general, shuts down the BCC, or I shouldn't say shuts down, but limits the scope of the BCCI mm-hmm. investigation. So I wonder why he did that, yeah. Sean. And then also, he was the one who told George H.W. Bush to pardon uh, six of the people involved in Iran-Contra, including Elliot Abrams. Uh, for lying, for perjury. And they were originally just going to um, pardon, I think, Casper uh, Weinberger. I think that's his name. But uh, uh, William Barr gave the quote, I told him, um, in for a penny, in for a pound, if you're going to pardon one of the Iran-Contra guys, pardon all the Iran-Contra guys. What? Baller. Yeah, and then we mentioned at the top here uh, Bill Clinton's uh, BCCI links. So his major fundraiser is cooked right into BCCI, Bill Clinton's is, so he's not going to look at what was going on there, and then the whole thing just gets swept under the rug. Maybe that's why Nixon went down. She didn't pardon any of his uh, <laughs> cronies. He hung them all out to dry, and so they were ready to flood. Mm-hmm. Big mistake. I just think Bill Clinton could take down BCCI because he just hated taking something down that had his initials, you know? <laughs> uh, a little more on Bill Clinton in, in part two and, and possible Epstein connections and all that. But um, I guess to just start... The her connections Bill? between Bill Clinton and Jeffrey Epstein? <laughs> <laughs> this is the first I'm hearing of this. Uh, it is interesting. Uh, one more thing with, with BCCI. Just researching this episode... We'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> researching this episode i've got two more months of billionaire episodes blocked out because there's <laughs> so many random fucking billionaires that just show up in the bcci scandal um you know they're they're giving money to everybody and again this is the bcci operating model it's pretty fascinating every country they go into they give jobs or just straight up cash bribes to influential political figures politicians uh, pr- they do this the most in Pakistan where they become like one and the same with the state and they're putting all these generals putting all their sons on the board of directors and this kind of shit um, but you know of course they do it in in Washington DC too and so they uh, like they work with Henry Kissinger's lobbying firm for a bit uh, they um, they work with various American billionaires, uh, some of whom we'll do future episodes on, and uh, they work very closely with the ruling family of the United Arab Emirates, which is also another billionaire family that we'll, we'll do a future episode on. Speaking of uh, Pakistan, um, it, uh, Trump killed, I don't know, al-Baghdadi or announced it today, mm-hmm. but he was, I, I tuned in for a segment of the speech, and he was talking about Bin Laden, and he was like, I said in my book, there's this guy, Bin Laden, he's tall, he's handsome. (laughs) (laughs) You you gotta take the good parts of our president, calling Bin Laden handsome. (laughs) Did they find on Bin Laden's computer if he preferred Evangelion or Ghost in a Shell? (laughs) Ghost in the Shell. (laughs) Uh, but yes, that was another thing. They were like, "Yo, we got all of Bin Laden's computers." But of course, he he was a political prisoner and had no internet connection, <laughs> and so like there was obviously nothing on there. Wasn't it? And that's I another he... thing where they just kind of wiped it under the rug. Like, yeah, uh, it's all uh, classified. You can't see his porn collection. I thought he had an internet connection, or was it just people would bring him shit on uh, thumb drives or whatever? Uh, it must have been on thumb drives or something. But or at least Hirsch said he didn't have an internet connection. Interesting. Yeah, because I forget the source for this but i remember there's a come down episode where they're talking about how he used to go on um youtube comments and argue with people <laughs> with 9-11 <laughs> truthers <laughs> and say no it was not an inside job i wonder if they'll do like a mini series of osama bin laden's last days because like on one hand it is a very like comedian on the road type of life where you're just hanging out for hours on end waiting for the end <laughs> Maybe I own, I'm the only one that looks at it like a comedian <laughs> on the road, but yep. it, it, it very much is the same vein, if you ask me. Well, apparently the Saudis were paying Pakistan to um, just keep them locked up. I mean, yeah, that so. makes sense, yeah. Right, and that's, you know, same I think... Same thing with comics. <laughs> <laughs> 
And jumping ahead just a little bit here, I think the most fascinating thing with the BCCI scandal and the the w- reason we're still uh, feeling the impact of this today is BCCI was the conduit through which the United States uh, funded the Mujahideen, the, uh, the fighters fighting the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So BCCI was the conduit, BCCI and the Pakistani intelligence. The CIA would give them a bunch of guns, give them pallet loads of money, just straight up hard American cash, and they would give it to the ISI and BCCI agents and say, okay, you bring this into Afghanistan. So big surprise, a whole shit ton of that goes missing and gets skimmed off the top. I wonder why. So part of the reason the ISI, the Pakistani intelligence that was protecting bin Laden, part of the reason they became so powerful is because we dumped billions of dollars directly (laughs) on their lap to fight the Soviets. And this is a very uh, evil and shady organization. And now they're one of the biggest intelligence organizations in the world. Exactly, because we dumped dumped billions of dollars and, you know, countless weapons, and we looked the other way at heroin trafficking uh, Mm -hmm. going through Pakistan and the the routes they controlled. Uh, You know, and so this is an organization, the ISI, that planned and carried out the Mumbai terrorist attacks. So it's like so much of what we see in the world today can be traced back to what we did with BCCI and, you know, with um, with all the uh, uh, the Indian occupation of Kashmir and this kind of shit. You have to imagine the ISI is is trying to do more operations there. So, you know, if a full scale war breaks out or even a uh, proxy war between India and uh, Pakistan, like we have really fueled the fire of this shit. We, oh, have, yeah. we have created the ISI and uh, made it into a very deadly and uh, straight up evil organization all to further, um, you know, our policy in Afghanistan, which also created Al Qaeda. <laughs> so it's like the U.S. is bad at giving people money to fight our own wars. Right. Yeah. But we defeated the Soviet Union and <laughs> n- uh, only good things have come from that. Right. It is something where it's like. The Soviet war, the Soviet Union's war against Afghanistan was a very horrific war, you know, depending on the estimates, one or two million dead, mm-hmm. uh, uh, mass civilian bombing, uh, mass rape by uh, Russian soldiers, all that shit. But the actual policy that we implemented there 100% made the situation worse, and we're living with the consequences of it today because we... just we, funded an insurgency. Right. We went to, you know... Uh, uh, the Pakistani Secret Service, which was also running heroin, and we said, here's as many weapons and as, as, many, as much money as you need, and we're not going to give a shit about all of the heroin trafficking and everything else you're involved in here. So, I mean, you know, it is just something where it makes sense that we don't hear about this because our entire political class is implicated in what they did here, and uh, they would rather just point at Pakistan and say, oh, it's a fucked up corrupt country and not acknowledge our role in what we have done. But I guess to start the episode, <laughs> uh, why don't why why don't uh, <laughs> how does this? I hope the levels are fucked up on that one, and people get <laughs> mad at us. <laughs> don't no, clean it. No, it will be fine. Um, how come so much corruption? in this country is swept under the rug so seamlessly everything you're talking about i've heard pieces of you know kind of my entire life every you know every single piece of that i've heard a little bit of but at no point has a thorough breakdown been been presented but more importantly it seems to me that the uh, arbitrators of all of this have never been identified or fucking uh taken a task on this why why does this continue part of it's baked into the system like you know, one thing with Nixon was that the uh, Watergate break-in was to attack his political opponents. But when you have something uh, like Iran-Contra or BCCI, where it's uh, crimes of the establishment, mm-hmm. uh, more bipartisan, then there's not the incentive to look into them, not the incentive to um, you know enforce them. Like, Nixon made lots and lots of enemies. That was pretty much his uh, M.O. His only crime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you know, when they were uh, impeaching him, uh, some of the higher ups in Congress or a lot of people in Congress wanted to uh, include a lot of his war crimes in Vietnam. But 
you know, for uh, most of the people who were kind of pushing the impeachment, they tried to keep those out of the impeachment because that was just business as usual. You right. know, mass murder was business as usual. But breaking in to your political opponent's uh, a hotel room, you know, that's that's OK. I can't wait till we start doing video feed for this podcast and the listeners get to see all of our Roger Stone Nixon tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> This is the the Nixon um, revisionist podcast. <laughs> I got Frost Nixon tattooed on my ass. Um, but so just to give a brief overview of Iran-Contra, because it's important that we kind of go through, hammer down the details here. So the Tower Commission is a Texas Senator John Tower, who we'll actually come back to in just a second here. Uh, he's uh, appointed in 1986 to write uh, this report of what happened with the Iran-Contra. And just I'm going to quote a paragraph from this here. Uh, quote, using the Contras as a front and against international law and U.S. law, weapons were sold using Israel as intermediaries to Iran during the brutal Iran-Iraq war. The U.S. was also supplying weapons to Iraq, including ingredients for nerve gas, mustard gas, and other chemical weapons. Again, the Iran-Iraq war, horrific war, at least a million dead, uh, really a World War One style war where there was chemical weapon usage by both sides, mm. um, you know, usage of child soldiers, and we were arming both sides of this conflict and really exacerbating the death toll and the war crimes that were committed there. And nerve gas is like probably the worst of the worst in terms of gases. Like it's uh, like sarin. It's the type of stuff where in the um, uh, Tokyo subway bombings, you know, just a little bit of it was released in the subways and there were, you know, pretty much just getting exposed to it will kill you. Oh, really? Well, yeah. And then we should explain who the Contras are, was a, a right-wing uh, rapist death squad in Nicaragua where, mm -hmm. you know, there was a socialist uprising. Uh, Daniel Ortega took over Nicaragua, and so the Reagan administration says, hey, we got to fund, you know, a right-wing death squad. That's what that video game was about. <laughs> <laughs> I never played that level. If you do, uh, what is it, up, down, up, down, left, <laughs> right, uh, you get to watch four nuns beg you for mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That was El Salvador, which we also did. Uh, but Number so one. So Human Rights Watch uh, released a report in 1989 which stated, quote, the Contras were major and systematic violators of the most basic standards of the laws of armed conflict, including by launching, indis including launching indiscriminate attacks on civilians, selectively murdering noncombatants, and mistreating prisoners, including mass rape. Uh, in uh, an affidavit to the World Court, a former Contra named uh, Edward, uh, Edgar uh, Chamorro testified that, quote, the CIA did not discourage such tactics. To the contrary, the agency severely criticized me when I admitted to the press that we had uh, that our organization had regularly kidnapped and executed agrarian reform workers and civilians. We were told that the only way to defeat the Sandinistas, the Nicaraguan socialists, was to kill, kidnap, rob and torture. So. Yeah, it's so embarrassing that Bernie Sanders supported the Sandinistas. <laughs> <laughs> And so BCCI was the intermediary for these deals because we've mentioned here after the church committee, after Watergate, is a Senate committee that tried to look in the CIA a little bit. Uh, actually, the, in the 70s, the Senate passed a law, or the Congress passed a law saying the CIA could not do assassinations. Oh, really? Which BCCI <laughs> comes back to because they just contract out their assassinations to BCCI. Uh, but... Um, and the then I guess uh, the, the drone program came along, and I guess if you do it from an airplane, it doesn't count. Right, right. I just drop shit from a plane. Yeah. Who it hit <laughs> is not my responsibility. But so, you know, um, the uh, National Security Council, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the CIA, they all have secret slush fund accounts at BCCI where they just park their money with BCCI, and BCCI is so good at taking money offshore and hiding it in the Cayman Islands that they are happy to hold money for these intelligence agencies to buy favors with them so that these intelligence agencies will look the other way on other shit BCCI is doing. But also, now they have their black ops budget again, and they can hide it from Congress. And, of course, Oliver North was uh, uh, the, one of the main players in Iran-Contra. He had a BCCI account. Adnan Khashoggi was one of the weapons dealers. Uh, he used BCCI as an intermediary. So... On both sides of this transaction, you know, the murdering rapist Contras and the horrific Iran-Iraq war, we are sending weapons and money and making the situation worse in secret, in violation of the Congress and uh, congressional law, uh, and BCCI is the intermediary profiting from that. So it's like, yes, this is worse than Watergate. There is no doubt in my mind. Mm. 
and it's just so little talked about today, and we still have all these fucking Democrats talking about Reagan as a decent, honorable Republican, you know? Yeah. So, that's the world we all live in. But uh, I guess we should just kind of... <laughs> I had nothing. I was like, Andy, play drop. <laughs> it's it got too fucking dark, and I need... <laughs> Can, uh, can you tell that this Frontline documentary was made in 1992? <laughs> yeah, they were just like, and then the Middle East, and then they just play an audio of... Uh, <laughs> just the most strained call to prayer. Like, I've, I've lived in a neighborhood with calls to prayer. Usually they just sound like someone singing, not someone... Uh, Dying. Just shredding their own larynx. <laughs> in fairness to Frontline, uh, pre-9-11, this was actually an original technique in filmmaking. <laughs> and then after 9-11, this is like the standard shot in every movie sure. with the Middle East. I'd like to think that they're like, is this the torture audio yeah. or the praying audio? <laughs> they, didn't, um, they didn't yet have footage of like the obstacle course, though. <laughs> right, right, the, right. Yeah, yeah, not yet. The, yeah. the they didn't have Al Qaeda didn't exist yet, so they yeah. didn't have any of that. But they did have, I think, another uh, like a twenty second thing of like guys with rifles. Mm. Dance, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny because like what the, when they're playing that sound, like the uh, what's on screen is just a city, and you're like, oh, it's just a city, and they're like the Middle East. <laughs> 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 Oh, okay. It's different. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. yes. This the is middle. the other. You're right, yeah. right, right. That's how Wisco Tango Foxtrot opens. Mm. <laughs> it's a live audio from the red light district in Lahore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so, to kind of go through the founding of BCCI, um, Aga Hassan Abadi was the bank's founder. He was born in 1922. He dies 1995. He, I mean, he was certainly for a time a billionaire. I don't know if he died a billionaire. It's it's a fascinating thing with the BCCI story where... But he did die a legend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Towards the end, people start looking for his the, his secret Swiss bank account number. Because again, you know, like 15 billion, depending on your estimate of depositor money, just vanished. Right. So theoretically, he definitely funneled some <laughs> of that into a Cayman Islands and or a Swiss bank account. Um, but... He's a fascinating character, and uh, he was born in um, uh, the uh, what was called the territory that that once belonged to the Mughal Empire in India. Um, I guess Yogi, you know a little bit more about that than I do, but uh, the the various uh, Muslim rulers of uh, large sections of India. Apparently, Abadi's family was um, I important people in the court of these Mughal rulers for at least a few hundred years. The Mughal rule was uh, when each state in India was run by royalty, and the Mughals were, I believe, primarily of the Islamic faith. And so the connection between... Can you say Mughals anymore? The connection to this guy, I believe, is that he was a part of the court function of that, that rule at that time. Yeah, they get really mad if Draco Malfoy calls them mudbloods. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the Mughals that lived in India when the partition went up would have to move across the border to Pakistan. Are you trying um, to say moguls? No, it's it's Mughal. M -U Mughal. M-U-G-H-A-L. Oh, oh. Yeah. Hey, you bitch. <laughs> I thought you were just mispronouncing mogul. No, no. That's <laughs> why I was, like, why, I was like, why is Andy stomping on my nuts right now? <laughs> God damn. The Mughals. Andy's the representation of white arrogance, <laughs> where he thinks he can correct an Indian guy on the pronunciation of the They're former Mughals. rulers of India. <laughs> India. Uh, but so, yeah, Abadi's family... I have were, no defense for this. <laughs> uh, Abadi's family were the... Uh, uh, throughout his family tree for several hundred years, they were the courtiers to the uh, the Mughal rulers in India. And actually, his great-grandfather, Abadi's great-grandfather, was hanged by the British because I think in 1857, there was a violent uprising against British rule uh, that his great-grandfather and several other... Uh, uh, people within the Mughal inner circle participated in. So Abadi's great-grandfather was was hanged uh, by the British. Yeah, it links to actually the Vijay Malia's uh, ancestral li lineage as well, because those were also freedom fighters among that period. So there were a whole bunch of uprisings against the British in India at that time. And to this fucking day, Brits, we coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> 
It is funny if you Google BCCI, the first result yeah. is actually the the I- Indian Cricket League. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, really? Which, huh. You know, <laughs> the CIA had to pay a lot to get that <laughs> right, shit right, set right, up. Right, right. <laughs> just impossible to research this subject now if you the, don't know where to look. There's a, like a dick load of Indian banks that just got way too many fucking initials as their bank names. Like, there's one that's like I C I C I C I, and it's like cut a couple of C's or I's, buddy. <laughs> it's, it's too much. Forget about. Forget about looking for BCCI on any video sharing site. <laughs> That's only the cricket one. Right, right. Um, but so the the history of uh, Aga Hassan Abadi, again, he's born 1922. In 1947-48 um, is, of course, the... 1942? The independence and partition of India. He's born in 1922, and then in 1947-48 okay. is the... Independence. Would and you I'll say he was born in 1922? Hassan Abadi, 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 Abadi. <laughs> Andy, you took way too much ADD medication today. <laughs> <laughs> just like, why was 1922 the trigger on that one? Is that a lyric in that song? No, it's just he kept saying Abadi, Abadi, and then well, 22 gotcha. rhymes with right. blue. Got it. This is this is how I'll the sausage gets made. <laughs> It's uh, it's uh, more of a um, the jungle system. <laughs> the wheel is turning and then it just stops every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> just like the uh, the fucking joke factory in Andy's head. Sometimes, like the safety inspector is just not looking, and this kind of shit comes out. And there's a massive collapse, and several workers are killed. I like that there's a safety inspector yeah. in that joke factory. And he, there's, he exists. The position's there, but yeah. he doesn't come out nearly as much as he used the to. The safety inspector is the guy who keeps the shit that doesn't make any sense in your head <laughs> and prevents you from saying it out loud and having your friends look at you blankly. <laughs> And he's like fucking doing a cover up uh, with OSHA investigators, <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on at his joke factory. <laughs> I'm just tweeting through it. No, this is the safest joke factory we've got. <laughs> Those statistics are wrong. The CNN's lying. Acting like Mueller in the 90s. <laughs> I don't yeah. see any problem with this joke factory. I mean, <laughs> honestly, everything they've pumped out has been A-quality, if you ask me. That was the Robert Mueller defense. Robert Mueller went on uh, TV a bunch of times with BCCI, and he would go something like, well, the people criticizing this just don't understand how investigation works. <laughs> you know, like, yes, we got all these hints in 1978, but it really does take until 1991 before you do the <laughs> right, slightest right, right. fucking thing about any of this. It takes 12 years to investigate a company. Are, are either uninformed naive or both. Uh, Robert Mueller of the Justice uh, Department. This is Sarah Kenzier from Gaslit Nation, and you're listening to Mueller She Wrote. The irony of... (laughs) Man, I hope this music isn't copywritten. (laughs) The irony, of course, being that Robert Mueller actually gaslit the American public (laughs) with regards to the BCCI investigation. Well, he made up for it with his uh, damning indictment of the the Trump presidency and uh, their, their Russia... Also, the Russia he- Ng. yes. Also, Robert Mueller, head of the S- FBI, during the cover up of the Saudi links to 9/11. <laughs> so uh, it's very, and that's the other thing. You know, we talk about this shit doesn't get mentioned. Robert Mueller became an American hero for Democrats. Again, these are people who nominally belong to the opposition party. This guy's yep. a fucking Republican operative his entire life who covers up BCCI, who covers up, helps cover up the uh, Saudi link to 9-11. And, uh, and the uh, American biological weapons link to the anthrax. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you heard none of that shit on MSNBC. I didn't even know any of this shit until just very recently. Yeah. And... If, you would think if the parties are oppositional, they do everything to destroy each other. The Democrats would want this shit out there. But, well, I guess if Robert Mueller's investigating Trump, you know, who cares? Let's just throw this shit all by the wayside. Um, <clears throat> um, but so uh, Aga Hassan Abadi, he uh, moves to Pakistan. Say the name three times. Yes. Aga Hassan Abadi. Aga Hassan Abadi. <laughs> Aga Hassan Abadi. I'm um, blue. You guys think as part of my research for this episode, I didn't practice and Google <laughs> how to pronounce names. You're doing great. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so he moves to Pakistan with the, the Civil War, the partition. He is originally in Lahore, the city of Lahore. He's working for, he gets a job in the Habib Bank, H-A-B-I-B. Um, and then in 1957, I believe, in 59, he launches a, a bank 
the first bank in Pakistan since its independence called the United Bank. Um, and UB? Yeah. And so the United Bank, he... Um, Abadi, what he does throughout this time, throughout the 50s, early 60s, he takes these trips to the United Arab Emirates, where, you know, this is the early part of petrodollars. The UAE has just found um, uh, oil deposits offshore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's clear there's billions of dollars coming in, but these are formerly just Bedouin tribes. You know, these are very... um, nomadic people who don't really have any sort of uh, banking system that they're about to have billions of U.S. dollars dumped onto them. And uh, Abadi is smart in that he recognizes that. And so he flies out to the uh, court of the very, of the sheiks in the UAE. He, you know, brings them rugs as a gift. And, you know, he talks to them about, um, let's set up a bank. The first guy throws him out, but then the first guy gets overthrown and replaced with a guy named Sheikh Zayed, Z-A-Y-E-D, who um, becomes one of the richest people in the world because of petrodollars, but uh, Sheikh Zayed is more receptive to Abadi, and um, Abadi actually takes him out to Pakistan, um, takes him um, falconing, you know, like that's what they like to sure. do. They have they have their falcons hunt these like turkey like birds, which were apparently got harder to do in UAE as all the money came in because everybody was doing it. So sure. he takes him out to Pakistan, where like the right. real falconing right. is mm-hmm. taking place. Um, and he also provides child prostitutes for his entourage. Wow. Uh, yes. So uh, the uh, the cool shit he does, and then the slightly more shady shit he does. So he's becoming like a well-known international banker. Right, yes. Yeah. Um, but I like so how falconing is kind of the equivalent of just like taking your dog out to a field with a bunch of rabbits and being like, go kill one. <laughs> <laughs> but you're doing it with a bird, so it's slightly Ooh, more acceptable. Yeah. yeah. But you get to wear the badass glove, though. That's true. That's right. I mean, all o- ownership of an animal is is either watching it kill stuff or killing stuff with that animal sometimes. That's what I do with my cat. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm coming down on this, but like whenever my cat kills uh, a mouse or a, a cockroach, right. I'm like, yeah, get it. <laughs> Just wearing like the fucking fat ass glove with yeah. a falcon on his <laughs> yeah, hand. Yeah, was wearing a, the glove when he hits <laughs> I'm wearing the glove, no but purpose. my cat's on it. <laughs> <laughs> They are, they are badass gloves. I mean, like I think Trade they're just like to, to stand on it. Yeah, they're like thick leather, so raven claws or whatever can't dig through it. But like, there is a very satisfying feeling to the look of that glove. It took me five years, but I finally trained her to stand on the glove. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the drops took so long, ladies and gentlemen. You get like two of them, and then you get the boots, so you have four <laughs> falcons. <laughs> and then you're like a Metal Gear Solid boss who like shoots fucking falcons at people. The <laughs> Shag- <laughs> <laughs> Uh But so, you know, what happens is um, uh, Abadi sets up this United Bank um, in uh, 59, and it's going pretty well, but it's confined to Pakistan. But then um, uh, Bhutto... Uh, Benazir Bhutto is a future prime minister of Pakistan. It's her father, the original Bhutto. He comes in, and he's originally like a socialist guy. He's very corrupt, but he nationalizes Abadi's um, <clears throat> United Bank and uh, various un- other industries in Pakistan. And Abadi has to play nice with him for a while, but then uh, Bhutto is later overthrown in a military coup and executed uh, very possibly on the suggestion of Abadi. Right. Now, for this, this nationalizing is in the 70s? This is in the 70s, yes. I believe his bank is nationalized either 71 or 72. Mm. So his solution, when his bank is nationalized, he's under Abadi is under house arrest for a little bit. His solution is he sets up a new bank. In 1972, he sets up BCCI. He incorporates it in Luxembourg because, of course, the Pakistani government won't let him have mm. a bank license in Pakistan. So he just goes abroad. Mm. Yeah, this, so in it ended up growing pretty rapidly. Uh, don't want to jump ahead too much, but between 1972 and 1976, mm-hmm. it started out at about a dozen branches and had an initial capital of like about 100 million and 200 million assets. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And then by the time of 1976, just four years later, it was at 108 branches and almost 1.6 billion. Right. And so his startup capital for BCCI in 1972 is 30% um, Bank of America, which was at the time, you might have heard of it, at the time the largest bank in the United States. Bank of America buys a 30% stake in it. Never heard of them. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So Bank of America buys a 30% stake in BCCI in 1972 because they want to get in on these petrodollars. Um, They would later sell their stake, but... (laughs) 
They would, <laughs> they would sell their stake, but they would remain a silent partner of BCCI, where it was entirely a cover your ass thing, where Bank of America's like, yeah, this fraud is getting a little out of control, <laughs> so we should probably publicly separate ourselves, but continue to, you know, um, be a counterparty for them and a broker for them and all these other things that we'll uh, maybe get back to a little later. But so they get a 30% stake from um, Bank of America, and then the rest of the money, or at least most of it, comes from Sheikh Zayed of um, United Arab Emirates. And again, he's uh, a former Bedouin who gets billions of dollars all at once from the oil deposits in the United Arab Emirates. And so uh, as his banker, Abadi is in a great place to grow very rapidly um, based on that. And the way I've seen it described as to what happens here is BCCI is set up in 1972. There's the oil boom, so they're just taking in billions of dollars. But then in the early 80s, there's a, an oil um, price collapse. So BCCI was always involved in, um, let's say, bribery to the Pakistani and uh, the UAE and the Saudis. Uh, they were always involved in this bribery. They were probably very early on also involved in intelligence gathering, uh, drug trafficking, uh, human trafficking. But what happens after the oil collapse in the early 80s is those parts of the business become much more prominent. Guys, just got an email from Louis C.K. His tour dates are out. And I need you to all to know that not only is he going to be in Peoria in Raleigh and Richmond, the uh, comedians B-cities, but he's also going to be in Tel Aviv, Israel. Oh, hell yeah. Holon, Israel. Mm. Detroit, Michigan, and Bratislava, Slovakia. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> this is where you go Party to work city. when you're out as a uh, <laughs> sexual abuser. Great but, town. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, he's paying these bribes to Saudis and such, and he's, he's switching in. But you really, you really can't tell this story without talking about Kamal Adham. Kamal Adham was a Saudi, uh, and he was the head of the Saudi intelligence agency from 1965 to 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the main Saudi counterpart of the CIA, uh, particularly throughout the 70s and 60s, and he just so happened to be the head of Saudi intelligence while George H.W. Bush was the head of the CIA. George H.W. Bush's president would later pretend he had never met Kamal Adham <laughs> at a wow. press conference during the BCCI scandal. Um but you I don't know anything about this man except I've read bad stuff about him, and uh, I I don't I don't like you know I don't like what I read about him. <laughs> that is George H. W. Bush, former head of the CIA, saying he has never heard of the head of Saudi intelligence during the time he was head of the CIA. <laughs> Yo, he needs for, for a guy who was the head of the CIA, he is a terrible liar. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've never heard of him. I, I mean, I I don't like what I read. I know yeah. that much. He's got the confidence I don't of like, a, you know. I don't like what I read about him. <laughs> He's got the confidence of a person <laughs> denying he's cheating on someone. So, I, yeah. He's a bad guy. I don't know yeah. what's going on with That's him. That's what I said about Sean when someone told me about him first. <laughs> <laughs> I got read about him. <laughs> That's what I say about Sean now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, so... By the way, someone posted something you did on, like, a Twitter, on, on like, an Instagram thing, and, yeah. and they, were, they were like, oh, this guy does the podcast. And from the podcast account, I said, we don't know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, look forward to that show. Yeah, um, I don't like you know I don't like what I read about him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so what happens here is you know BCCI's transformation to let's say straight up intelligence op or or whatever you want to call it to the point where it's not even really recognizable as a bank by the mid eighties. Its transformation is, many people allege, guided by the CIA and Saudi intelligence. Because we've mentioned the Church Committee a bit here, where they're trying, the CIA is trying to hide black ops money from Congress and congressional oversight. Why is it going to be black? <laughs> they're trying to hide this money, and um, what happens is uh, Kamal Adham, again, the head of Saudi intelligence, 65 to 79, works with BCCI, becomes I don't a... Like, you know, I don't like what I... Read about him. <laughs> uh, he works with BCCI. He becomes a front for BCCI, one of the people who helps them buy an American bank, one of uh, the people who's like, yeah, I'm here on uh, behalf of BCCI to buy this bank. He gets millions of dollars in un unrepaid loans from BCCI. And, um, and it is just something where there are allegations that are pretty convincing to me where you have to imagine some of this change in BCCI was guided by both Saudi intelligence and the CIA, 
because, of course, this guy is the CIA's main link to Saudi. Um, and I, what I found kind of interesting here, uh, just uh, quoting, or not quoting, but uh, from the book The Outlaw Bank, um, Kermit Roosevelt, you might be familiar with Teddy Roosevelt's grandson, who was actually the man on the ground who launched Operation Ajax, the coup in Iran. He, you know, uh, uh, put all these money in different people's hands, started a bunch of fucking fake riots to get, you know, the uh, people out on the street and the military to come in. Uh, Kermit Roosevelt was later representing the defense firm Northrop. This is before it <laughs> merged with, with Grumman. Um, and so uh, the outlaw bank quotes Kermit Roosevelt as saying that in the mid-60s, Kamal Adham, the head of Saudi intelligence, was being... Uh, he was repping three different U.S. defense firms, really? <laughs> the head of Saudi intelligence, and uh, because Kermit Roosevelt was working for Northrop at the time, it was his job to court Kamal Adham and get him to rep a fourth U.S. <laughs> defense firm, which was Northrop. Well, so, to be fair, it's not easy being green. Right. <laughs> so it is something where the U.S. defense establishment and all these defense companies, which of course make a lot of money selling weapons to Saudi and you know UAE and whoever the fuck, whatever human rights violators, they are very much tied up in the CIA and Saudi intelligence. Um, there's another thing from the Outlaw Bank where they talk about Kamal Adham uh, in, um, uh, I think it's 76, the uh, State Department intervenes to protect Kamal Adham from uh, SEC bribery charges? Yes. 1976, the um, U.S. State Department intervenes to protect Kamal Adham and Boeing from SEC bribery charges. Because the way, you know, these weapons and other deals uh, worked in Saudi Arabia is you would get an agent to the royal family who would take a quote-unquote commission, which is, you know, under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, functionally equivalent to a bribe. Uh, which is not legal, but you have to pay these uh, various people who are connected to the royal family, you have to pay them off. Mm. So another thing BCCI does is they become a way of hiding these bribes that Boeing and all of these defense contractors are paying to various people within the Saudi and UAE government and such. Um, and the State Department is in 1976 intervening to protect this guy from bribery charges. So it, it is just something where at very high levels of the U.S. government, we're working with this guy who just happens to be a major BCCI shareholder, board member, in addition to just the head of Saudi intelligence, uh, which just happened to torture and kill political opponents throughout his entire time there. So the bank is very much part of the state almost. Right. I think like um, it's it's very much part particularly the Pakistani state, where it's almost indistinguishable from the ISI and the Pakistani military, and so many people are given jobs and straight-up bribes from there. But also they do a very similar thing with, uh, with the Saudi government and even more so with the UAE government. But I guess we'll kind of uh, wrap up this first half here and uh, this first part, and we'll talk more on the next episode about how BCCI eventually fell and we'll talk a bit about, uh, in part two, if necessary, part three, we'll talk about possible Jeffrey Epstein and possible uh, child trafficking links. Though I guess I should just mention one more thing here. We mentioned the Tower Commission report at the beginning of this episode. Is um, Senator John Tower is the guy who wrote the official report on Iran-Contra. And so in the Outlaw Bank, the, uh, the journalists interview a former member of— Is that the guy who lost a bunch of family on 9-11? <laughs> He actually did die in a plane crash, which is, oh. I looked into it a bit. There are conspiracy theories that John Tower was assassinated on this plane crash, and I haven't been able to find any, like, convincing evidence of that. However, it is weird how a whole bunch of BCCI people, including Adnan Khashoggi and um, Robert Maxwell, Ghislaine Maxwell's father, and this guy, all died in 1991 mostly under sort of mysterious circumstances. And hmm. all of these people are heavily involved in BCCI. There was also a journalist who was killed, uh, which we will talk about. Um, it's a good year for cleaning house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so I wanted to just mention here, um, in the, the book The Outlaw Bank, the authors interview a, uh, at the time, member of the Black Network. Oh, uh, it's got to be Black, Sean. Come on. <laughs> Which, again, BCCI's Secret Intelligence Service, they have about 1,500 members. And um, he talks about how uh, you can't talk finances with any of the royal families, you know, the UAE, the uh, Saudi royal family. He says mainly you just either talk about camels or you bring them girls. Or he also <laughs> says that the westernized sons... That sounds racist. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> 
he says that the westernized sons they would actually bring cocaine for them you know like the westernized sons of the uh, various royal families would do cocaine but he also says quote they would bring them young boys unquote uh, just to hang a, out yeah <laughs> just a little disturbing um, play video games yeah back, back ribs, right? <laughs> really into Contra <laughs> but what I wanted to mention here and, and place on a uh, Capcom you think they're raping those boys Sean Yes, I absolutely do. And in fact, even the Kerry Committee, this is Senator John Kerry, does a report on BCCI where he says that they would go to, um, I think it's called the Diamond Market, and get these quote-unquote dancing girls, which were children who would be trafficked to the various, mm. the sheiks and the entourages from the UAE and Saudi and other places. Uh, they say they've found a testimony from people as young as eight years old uh, who were um, you know, raped and uh, their bodies were damaged by this rape. Uh, but eight-year-olds, 12-year-olds, very young girls. Wow. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, it's the kind of thing that makes the average citizen puke and look at this system and say, yuck, you know, what's going on? This is, of course, uh, John Kerry, who went on to uh, help the Saudis, uh, helped facilitate the Saudis carrying out their genocide in Yemen. What a good dude. Yeah. yeah. Really, really upstanding, strong moral compass. Yeah, sorry. Also featured prominently as one of the good guys in the Frontline documentary on BCCI, Congressman Chuck Schumer, oh. yeah. who would later go on to be one of the most corrupt Democrats in the Senate. Yeah, there's, just, there's this part where he's like, you know, I realize, like, if you see where the money's going in and where the money's coming out, you can... Uh, you can learn a lot about how, how this corruption goes down. And it's like, yeah, I I'm, assume you want to learn that. Uh, I mean, it's so funny how, like, when Sean opened the learned. episode, he was like, you know, the people in power are still the same people. And then we're literally bringing up these politicians <laughs> that in today's, you know, society have pretty good moral standings for the most part. And yeah. criticism of them from the liberal group is, you know, like, disdained in such a, mis- you know, erroneous mm-hmm. level. And it's like, no. These, these fuckers are proliferating these goddamn crimes against humanity yeah. and contributing to the uh, elite status that America has trafficked in for all time. Well, it is kind of funny. It's the kind of thing that makes the average citizen puke. And look at this. <laughs> puke. Puke. Yuck. <laughs> puke. <laughs> it, puke. 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 <laughs> It is kind of funny where... Um, What's going on? <laughs> Dude, do the remix, though. <laughs> we'll go out on that. All right, yeah, cool. Yeah. It is kind of funny where, you know, John Car- in the early 90s, John Kerry and Chuck Schumer are the people blowing the whistle on the evil that is BCCI. Right, right. Yeah. And then they would, of course, go on to use that as a springboard to becoming part of the power structures that they are condemning and uh, yeah. perpetrating uh, similar uh, atrocities, if not quite on the Phew. same level. Uh, so hopefully Grubstakers yeah. gets to follow the John Kerry <laughs> Chuck Schumer route yeah. where we are doing an episode condemning BCCI, yeah. but 10 years this podcast will be like promo- doing ad reads What's for an even on? worse scam than BCCI. Uh, shell company three, four levels deep. Puke. Hey guys, uh, we got the uh, Grubstakers episode on uh, the McDonald's clown sponsored by Libra, the currency we all use, and I uh, don't need to tell you any more about it. Uh, okay, we're getting the evil eye from our laptops, so we got to go now. Now, uh, Grubstakers, you know we only tell you the truth, but we're here to talk about the essential reforms that have been done in the Lahore diamond market. Uh, all of the dancing girls are now 18 years old minimum. And uh, this is actually a voluntary sex worker transaction. Yeah, and we talked to the girls, and they just said they want to have fun, so I don't see what's wrong with what's going on, you know? Grubstakes is brought to you by the Parallax Consulting Firm. (laughs) Parallax. When a a senator uh, gets in your way. Look, we know... Parallax. (laughs) We never never bullshit you guys, but uh, Andy's going through an eviction, so we have to do these ad reads for child trafficking now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, but I guess the last thing, and, and we'll certainly continue this uh, on the uh, the next part on the uh, paywall on the Patreon side, um, because you know we'll talk about some of the confessions of former Black Network members that are. Uh, Why has it got to be Black, Sean? Come God on, damn it. really, really got to tone it down with all this uh, race hate you got. We'll, we'll talk about some of their confessions about you know doing assassinations, blackmail, spying. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to mention <laughs> what. God damn it! One of the only named. American politicians in the outlaw bank. And there's 
uh, I couldn't find a source for this anywhere else, but these are, you know, former time correspondents who wrote this book. Uh, every allegation they wrote, they were way ahead of federal investigators breaking the story for Time magazine, and everything they said has been uh, borne out, was borne out by the subsequent investigation. So they interview this former member of the uh, the White Network. Um, All right, <laughs> finally. <laughs> Acceptable. Yeah. Equality indeed. So uh, one of the correspondents asks him, so who did you get to, quote, in terms of American politicians? And this member of BCCI's intelligence service says, quote, Senator John Tower, they knew his weaknesses. They sent him women, young beauties from Lahore, then got videos and films. And this is Senator John Tower, who we mentioned at the top of the episode wrote the... You're, ta- you're supposed to refer to them as the sex workers. <laughs> Senator John Tower, we mentioned at the top of the episode, wrote the official um, Tower uh, Commission report, which was the look into the Iran-Contra. And a lot of people who were named in that report, such as Oliver North, were very upset about it. It clearly told a lot of things that were true um, and is reliable in parts, uh, but it paints Reagan as just being unaware of what was going on, of being kind of a bad or incompetent manager who, who didn't really wasn't involved in these decisions when I think he very much was. Um, but it also kind of covers up the role of George H.W. Bush. So it is just weird that Senator John Tower uh, is the only, as far as I could find, person who is named as a blackmail victim mm. of this BCCI network who also happened to be the guy who wrote the government's official report on the Iran-Contra scandal. So, you know, maybe... It's even worse, and I have to imagine, just of like some of the allegations, that a lot of shit happened in Iran-Contra that is even worse than what the public at large knows. Um, and, of course, John Tower was killed in an airplane crash in 1991. There are conspiracies that he was murdered. I haven't seen any evidence for that, but I think it is, to me, very credible that he was blackmailed uh, with these trafficked uh, underage girls uh, by BCCI operatives. The green countries are the countries where we wash our money. <laughs> the blue countries Excuse are the... Excuse me, Mr. President, sir. Yes. <laughs> um, but I guess uh, to kind of wrap up as we as we go on to the other, uh, as the next subject, what you find with BCCI is a lot of things that are very familiar with the Jeffrey Epstein case. There was actually, we'll talk about it on the next episode, there's a 1988 Florida plea bargain to let BCCI off the hook, which seems Shoot. to be <laughs> seems to be a running theme with these kind of sex trafficking operations uh, that yeah. are maybe connected to the intelligence agencies of the world. Um, there's a lot of running themes here, and the 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 trafficking of Jeffrey Epstein, I think, very credibly, is at least linked to the Central Intelligence Agency and the Mossad. And yeah, there's a um an article, it, but it hasn't been corroborated, so it's it's hard to um, say how credible it is. Uh, but it was claiming that a former Mossad agent uh, had stated that uh, Jeffrey Epstein was recruited into the Mossad by Robert Maxwell, who Seymour Hersh claimed uh, was not a, um, a spy for Israel, but, you know, uh, uh, it, it's it's kind of up for grabs but then um basically uh epstein's job was to acquire blackmail for Mossad, right mm. which i mean it wouldn't be shocking according to this no. article. right should we yeah. do the rest of this epstein stuff on part two yeah Just part two and if necessary part three we'll come back to some of the uh various epstein connections and his possible links to bcci and we'll also close out the story of how bcci eventually imploded and um let's say the cover-up since then, how we just, since 1993, even though the lawsuits for various shareholders have been ongoing all the way up to 2017, trying to get their fucking money back, there's just been no news reports and no discussion of this to the point where BCCI, like, myself included, most Americans had no idea what the fuck you were talking about until I researched this episode. Um, so we, we'll follow up with that. Uh, check us out, uh, patreon.com uh, slash grubstakers. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully get through this entire story and crack the case. But you know what? Check out the Patreon because that's where the libel is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, where, that's where the shit yeah. that we're going to get sued over <laughs> is all stashed. And with that, this has been Grubstickers. I'm Yogi Powell. I'm Andy Palmer. I'm Steve Jeffries. I'm Sean McCarthy. Thanks for listening. Shoot. See you on part yeah. two. Yeah.
What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Oh, I want to be held accountable for what I'm doing. You know, this may sound like an, an exaggeration, but it was like the 9-11 of my career and certainly of making kombucha. Jesus is smart. This idea of income inequality, that always strikes me as a very, it's a deceptive term, income inequality. Well, let's flip it around. It comes from outcome inequality. Welcome to the premium side of Grubstakers. We are continuing our investigation of BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. We are safely behind the paywall. You know who we are. And because we are behind the payroll, paywall, I can say it, Roy Cohn and J. Edgar Hoover are pedophiles. <gasps> and they did traffic children, and that is part of the Epstein conspiracy. Man, Which more Epstein dirt keeps coming out, and it it won't it won't end. If it feels true, then it probably is. Because <laughs> like they give you like the tiniest kernel, and you're like, okay, well this has more questions than answers, and then you're like, like it dies down like for a week or two, and then new shit comes out that's like semi related, but then not. It's just a fucking rabbit hole of madness. He was just a, a brilliant financier who. Uh, you know, got a little out of hand, and then uh, once he went to the prison system, you know, the conditions are so bad <laughs> that uh, he uh, uh, wrapped a paper towel around his neck, and, um, you know. Like, and so this Roy Cohn, J. Edgar Hoover pedophiles thing, this is actually Whitney Webb is a reporter for Mint Press, and a lot of what she says about Epstein is accurate. Uh, I, It was something where I was doing all this BCCI research, and then I saw that, and I'm like, well, I don't have time to investigate <laughs> this shit. Yeah, I think I've got was, enough rabbit holes. She was the one who did the, um, well, the Mossad connection to Epstein, um, going into the Mossad guy who left and then said right. that. Epstein was recruited by what's his name? Right. Robert Maxwell. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and that is something I wanted to talk about here because we're going to continue with the story of BCCI where you left where we left you is like right around the start of the Afghan war, all that. But what I what I wanted to start by saying is I do believe there are real conspiracies. I believe there are real things that particularly the CIA, but other levels of the federal U.S. government were involved in that they have covered up. But I also believe there are fake ones. Oh, really? you know, because I think that's uh, there was a CIA disinformation. <laughs> there was a CIA disinformation agent, uh, and he gave this quote to Congress, I believe, and he said his job was to create a wilderness of mirrors, so that whenever people uh, go off and chase and try to investigate something, they'll get to the end and realize they're just staring at a mirror, mm. you know, which theoretically points you to another mirror that you go and investigate. Right. So, um, wait, do you mean a mirror as in like? you go through a whole bunch of hurdles of shit, and then when you end at it, it's pointing back at you, or that you've just done a reflection of your own research? Uh, my meaning, and I'm paraphrasing that quote, but I think what he meant is that it's a mirror, but it's pointed at another mirror. Mm. So it's a, wi gotcha, it's a gotcha. wilderness okay, yeah. of mirrors. I, I thought you were saying that you do like all this you shit, this. and then at the end, <laughs> like a number 23 <laughs> situation, you're the reason this shit's <laughs> happening. And I was like, this is some good fucking dirt, Sean. <laughs> That's why so many people investigating the uh, the finder's cult have killed themselves under mysterious circumstances. Because <laughs> yeah. you get to the end, and you're like, I was the finder's <laughs> right, cult pedophile. Right. Yeah. That's pretty much how the... Uh, like the new strategy for global warming by like petrol companies where oh, they're yeah. like, you know, the real culprit in global warming is you. Consumer. <laughs> yeah. The change your, change your spinning habits yeah. are coming from the inside of the house. Yeah. But the hall of mirrors thing, like you can definitely see it play out. If you, um, if you've seen the documentary, uh, wormwood by Errol Morris about how there was, um, this uh, guy who worked for the biological weapons uh, wing of the CIA during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, initially reported that he uh, fell or jumped out of a window. And they said that that was a uh, um, possible suicide. And then when MKUltra came out, they said, oh, no, we gave him acid. And then he jumped out a window a month later. We're so sorry. And then it eventually came out, though hasn't been officially confirmed, that yeah, he was killed because they were worried that he was going to talk about U.S. biological weapons use what? in uh, North Korea during the Korean War. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I also remember for that documentary, there was something in uh, a CIA assassination manual about like the best way to kill people is push them out of a window high up. Yeah, it was. It, it can look like a suicide. Yeah, it was exactly like it, it matched like uh, directly how he died, where it's uh, you want to someone to fall out of a window around 10 stories up. He was, of course, on like the 11th floor. And also, before throwing them out a window, you want to land a blow to the temple. And when they exhumed his body and re-examined it, uh, they did find that like there was a trauma hit to his head that um, had, I guess, coagulated. Or it, it, it. They found that it wasn't from him either hitting the ground because he didn't hit the ground on that side, and it couldn't have been from going through the window because there were no uh, glass cuts oh, on him. Yeah. yeah, but when you're really depressed and about to kill yourself, you often hit yourself in the head <laughs> yeah. before jumping out of a window to punish yeah. your brain for giving you those thoughts. And you also break the window ahead of time instead of, say, opening it. or <laughs> You break it and then yeah. hit your head and then you jump. Yeah. That's the common suicide manifesto. Yeah. Uh, b- a- bef- after you take acid, that's the most of important course, part. Of course, of course. I think you take acid on the way down. <laughs> Um, but I guess with with regards it's to really this, tough with the paper because you got to <laughs> really get it under the tongue and it's got to <laughs> hold it. And if you drop it, it flies away. With regards to this wilderness of mirror shit, we're going to finish the BCCI story. We're going to talk a bit about what is confirmed with regards to BCCI child trafficking and uh, with regards to BCCI links to the CIA. By the way, but, if you're in New York and want to go to the hotel where the guy uh, fell or jumped, uh, it's right by Penn Station. Check it out. <laughs> Um, but I guess we should at least mention, uh, and again, we're going to do this part two if uh, necessary. We'll probably have to do a part three as well just to get all this shit in here. But we will at least mention the Finders cult, the Franklin scandal, some of this other shit that uh, Whitney Webb for Mint Press has written about. I'll, I'll quote some of her articles. And so it's just like kind of the farther on you go, the more it's like we don't really know for sure. But it's it's worth talking about these things. And it is something where, uh, you know, Steve and Andy, you did a bit of research on the Finders cult. And I looked at that shit and I was like, well, this is too perfect. <laughs> this is like a satanic pedophile CIA ring. Like they had to put that shit out there to keep us off the BCCI trail or the Epstein trail. And I don't know the truth. You know, it's just one of those yeah. things where I have no idea if this is true or not, or just a, a mirror, as it were. Sean knows the truth, but he's waiting till 400 patrons show up to just reveal it to all of our listeners. That would be a great <laughs> fucking scam. <laughs> we we say what's, at, it, what's in the safe? Yeah, at one thousand patrons, <laughs> we, we blow will, the Epstein thing wide yes. open. At one thousand patrons, and then we all kill ourselves at nine ninety eight <laughs> patrons, <laughs> just to drive the internet <laughs> insane. <laughs> this is occurring into a cargo cult. <laughs> just keep waiting. Like, what happens at six hundred patrons? <laughs> you don't want to know. What new What new data drop? <laughs> But so uh, where we left you last time is BCCI was founded in 1972, originally in Luxembourg. And we talked a little bit about it, but we should go back to kind of the oil crunch as to how BCCI was able to grow so much where uh, Abadi, Aga Hassan Abadi, the founder, was was smart in the sense that he recognized all the petrodollars were coming into the Middle East. So if he could be the bank for particularly the UAE and to a lesser extent the Saudis, if he could be their bank of choice then he would make billions just on the commission alone. Mm. And then the oil crunch in particular, like raises global oil prices so much, it makes overnight billionaires. Yeah. So I think this 1973 to 74 oil crisis uh, brought on by OPEC as a response to, as kind of a political move to get, what was it? The U S the, uh, was it? The U S the UK to stop supporting Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. It and is. they succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, politi- politically, I think most historians would agree that it probably didn't work. But um, in terms of causing some real sabotage and chaos economically for the the, the countries that OPEC uh, turned the spigot off to, like yeah, it was you could say it was a success. Yeah. But anyway, like the BC the BCCI uh, this this oil crisis kind of gave them more of a reason to exist because mm. the u.s started sanctioning opec countries and these countries a few of them who they did business with and created a need for an alternative sort of payments infrastructure and it, it by a bank that happened to have a lot of u.s dollars yeah and it it, it did like kind of restructure uh, american foreign policy where instead of just supporting israel you know america already had kind of deals with the saudis but american 
support for Saudi Arabia, like one thing they did accomplish for those in power in Saudi Arabia was it really strengthened um, America. It, it made, I guess, probably America realize how reliant they are on, you know, OPEC um, doing what they want it to and kind of strengthened America's bonds to the Saudis um, because, you know, they know that the Saudis can uh, kind of trigger an economic crisis. Um, and at the same time, um, shit, what was I going to say? Uh, well, we were talking on the previous episode a lot about BCCI as an intermediary between countries that can't be seen doing business. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's very, uh, BCCI also helps get, say, Iranian oil to Israel through Mark Rich, even though after the uh, Ayatollah comes to power, Iran is officially sanctioned. But right. BCCI is very much an intermediary in all these transactions. And just to recap, they, between 1973 and 1976, they grew from 200 million in assets to over 1.6 billion in assets. Nice. And even for like a well-connected international bank, that's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's considering they were stealing 200% of those deposits. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, well, part of it, uh, I mean, as we've already shown and will continue in this episode, is just illicit activity. Mm -hmm. But then I think there is a real economic impetus in from the sanctions and the oil crisis. Right. Like, that's the great thing is uh, BCCI, when it collapsed, is about $20 billion bank in 1991, which was at the time the seventh largest private bank in the world. But um, uh, we uh, don't have to tell you the black ops part of that is not part of that figure. So it's a $20 billion bank that is also probably the leading weapons dealer, um, drug trafficker, money launderer, uh, subcontractor for various intelligence agencies, and of course, you know, child trafficking. So mm -hmm. all of those businesses. The green business countries are the countries we sell arms to. The green countries are the countries where we wash our money. <laughs> Uh, yeah, run right out of the Reagan White House. <laughs> um, but I guess uh, to kind of continue the story uh, of BCCI, uh, uh, we mentioned Aga Hassan Abadi. He moves to Karachi after the Indian Civil War. He's originally in Lahore. Camille Lanciani's hometown. Yes, he's in Karachi. Um, and uh, Karachi's like a port city in Pakistan. And it Why are you looking at me when you're saying this stuff, Sean? <laughs> what, what, what do you want Tell me, me if I'm wrong. I, mean, I got yes, no. to be the resident Pakistan expert on this show. What's wrong with that? I was hoping. I was Yo, hoping. He has the, uh, he, he has the Kamal Nanjiani fact. Uh -huh. Yes. And that's it. That's it. That's yeah. all I got. <laughs> he no. is, that, that is the law. He's the resident Kamal Nanjiani expert. <laughs> Only on his hometown, though. Nothing yeah. else. I do like our billionaire podcast. Yogi is the guy who gives us facts about Indian comedians. <laughs> <laughs> like I was listening to that episode you guys did where Yogi disses Tom Thacker out of nowhere. Yeah. Why wouldn't I? Fuck him. <laughs> Fuck his face. I'll say not it again. Even, not even on the paywall. <laughs> on the free side. Hey, yeah. I want to say this about the new Dr. Doolittle. Is, uh, Camille Nanjiani, he's playing an ostrich, but he has an accent because his first language is Urdu. Does that mean that ostriches speak <laughs> Urdu, but then when they're talking to Dr. Doolittle, who doesn't speak Urdu, he has to speak English? And then and then uh, if, if he only speaks Urdu, he can't speak to a human because uh, only the one speaks to ostriches. So unless Robert Downey Jr. learns Urdu, yeah. he can't speak to this ostrich in his native tongue. That's what yeah. we're going to. Or is it implied that he's speaking Urdu to them? But it's, I, it comes I, out no. as English so that we understand. No. It doesn't. But Andy's Andy's bringing this fantasy to life. I'm I'm just saying he's got an accent. Like how if if, if you're yeah, what's the ostrich accent from? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Because he's not learning English from a Pakistani man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A uh, fun BCCI fact is that the people involved in the black ops or like, you know, drug trafficking, all these other uh, illicit businesses, mm -hmm. they would all be Urdu, uh, Urdu speakers. Mm. So they'd be Pakistanis, you know, at all the different branches. And they would only... Some keep, of them ostriches. Yeah. They would only keep <laughs> notes of illegal transactions in Urdu. And they would only... Urdu. 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 They would only keep the notes of these transactions in Urdu and they would keep them in safes. Uh, so you would have these, you know, billions and billions of dollars of illegal money flowing right. around. And the only way of keeping track of it is these like notes in code in Urdu <laughs> or like these coded phone conversations in Urdu. Right. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a monstrosity to try and uh, piece back together when it all comes down. That we, is funny that their strategy is like, well, not a lot of people speak Urdu. So we can just write <laughs> out exactly what we're doing. <laughs> well, Basically you know, invulnerable, yeah. legally right. speaking. 
Well, when we're talking about on the free side, how they were offering uh, children and drugs, among other things, to convince them to work with one another, part of me was like, I know there's a racial aspect of we don't speak their language, but I'm sure they fuck with what we fuck with, Mm -hmm. and that's cocaine and boys. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, now that we're behind the paywall, Yogi can enlighten us on how the Pakistani mind relates to the BCCI (laughs) scandal. Yeah, Yogi, off mic, you were saying something about their um, the contours of their skulls. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You see, a lot of people don't know this, but the partition was based purely on skull size <laughs> and caste ranking. And obviously, everyone that's not a Hindu, uh, 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 infidel of the Islamic gods, deserves to live outside the border because their skulls are just smaller. It'd be great. We get to the pay side, and Yogi's like, you know, I couldn't really say this on the free side, but the BCCI young boys thing, not really surprising because all <laughs> Pakistani stand-up comedians <laughs> are pedophiles. It's part of the Urdu nature. Why are you mad and talking about shit about Tom Thacker? You, what, no, you, you, no, I don't care. You got, I, you got support for Tom? Huh? I, uh, I like saying, Tom Brady. All we're saying is that Harvey Weinstein uh, raked in uh, Academy Awards, and we all know what he was up to. Now Kamal Nanjiani's got an Academy Award. Mm, mm. Good point. Nomination. Uh, he didn't win. He didn't win? Oh, no. That movie sucked. <laughs> Big sick. <laughs> You, and you all see it? Not that good, no. No. Hey, Judd Apatow, how about you make something that isn't a piece of shit again? Uh, <laughs> and Kumail Nanjiani and Pete Holmes. He's listening. He's like, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> the entire crew, they keep saying the same story. Like, hey, Pete Holmes, you're going to make a show about your life in New York. How about you cast someone that's not a fucking 39-year-old to play someone doing an, you know, a 19-year-old comedian job? Hey, Kumail, you're going to tell the same story that is your your life with, with your love? That's fine, but maybe don't be yourself because you're, I don't know, two decades removed from the incident <laughs> you know, that's happening in this fucking movie. In fairness, Judd Apatow is like the BCCI scandal of Hollywood mm-hmm. because right. he has been creatively insolvent for more than a decade, <laughs> and yet the powers that be are protecting him and preventing his collapse. Well, see, he was linked to uh, Gary Shandling, the Mueller of the entire uh, investigation. That made me so fucking mad, too, because I love Gary Shandling, and I watched that documentary. It's so much fucking job at Judd Apatow yeah. in his uh, tribute to his dead Gary Shandling See, friend. now we're touching on the Wait, what happened? What is this? The us. HBO two-part uh, Gary Shandling documentary. It, it has to be two parts, because one of the parts is Judd Apatow. Oh, it's like, just Judd Apatow talking up. about Gary Shandling? Yeah. Uh, yeah like, it's Apatow's uh, jerk letter to Gary Shandling. And Apatow made it, and in fairness, Apatow was a writer on the uh, Gary, Shand- uh, Gary Shandling show. Oh, you mean, in fairness, uh, Shandling gave Apatow the career he has currently? Yeah, you're not wrong about that, Sean. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, you know, listen, I ain't that mad at, at Apatow. He's just Wait, a guy Wait, when you say gave best. him the career he has currently, did Judd Apatow kill Gary Shandling? <laughs> The Larry yeah, but, Sanders show. But yeah, Gary Shandling uh, uh, hired Apatow early on. And like Funny People is based on Sh- uh, Apatow's oh, relationship Shandling. with Shandling. Uh, yeah. So like they, there's a uh, tenured history. Like, oh, so uh, their their working relationship was kind of directionless and uh, <laughs> <laughs> lacking <laughs> a strong overarching plot narrative. Very Just similar. It's kind of really bleak and uh, not a good movie at all. And yeah. uh, certainly not a comedy. Anyway... <laughs> All I'm confirming is Kumail does not have an Academy Award. (laughs) I want that to be clear to all our listeners. Yogi's like, you know the Urdu word for uh, consensual sex is actually uh, means rape small children. (laughs) (laughs) I like how Sean's putting words in my mouth. And instead of just, hey, Yogi, say this, he's like, Yogi says, and then just does a whole bunch of racist shit against brown people. (laughs) Oh, you know, it's really funny when Sean said the N-word 70 yeah. times. <laughs> but that's the plausible deniability aspect of white irony racism, is you say, no, this other character yes. who's racist <laughs> said these things. Mm-hmm. The Quentin Tarantino me. of uh, yes. media. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, you know. Uh, the, the Jeff Dunham, old Walter puppet. Yeah. You know, that was written Yogi, by Yogi, how Lennon. dare did you say that? What really? Yeah, Rob. Like a lot of Dunham's characters were written by a couple people, and a good chunk of Walter was written by Robert Ben Grant and Tom Lennon from Reno 911 in the state. Hmm, I, I got to get a paycheck, I guess. I mean, like you know, write racist jokes for my puppet character. That's a job you you do. <laughs> can we get Can we get back to phrenology? <laughs> anyway, so these Pakistani skulls, they bitch ass skulls. <laughs> I'm saying it here first and last. So. In my in my will, just know everything goes back to me in the grave. <laughs> no one gets my shit. I really do. I, I you know, like you say, I'm like quoting you fakely, but I'm actually trying to promote the yogi becomes an Indian nationalist transformation <laughs> arc because oh. I think it would be nice to observe oh, over the course <laughs> of this podcast, yogi getting <laughs> radicalized and then 
there's just like these it, it's like anthony kumia towards the end of opie and anthony where he would right, go right, on these right, right. these long racist rants and opie would just be like on his phone or ignoring it you know <laughs> and so it's just yogi's like doing these pro modi rants mm-hmm. for like 20 <laughs> minutes and then there's these long pauses we have to edit out <laughs> once we start doing video you'll get to see the tapestry that's right it's just a map oh, it's yeah. a map of Kashmir, uh-huh, uh-huh. and it shows what territory is <laughs> taken over <laughs> The cutting board I have is yeah. a map of cashmere. Yeah. yeah, and it's labeled by Brain Pan. <laughs> <laughs> we like we start doing the video, and then in Yogi's room, it's just pictures of Modi everywhere. <laughs> and then there's yeah, the map map of Kashmir that has it as part of India. <laughs> and then there's uh, like lists of people being detained with the words terrorist written <laughs> next to them. <laughs> Um, <laughs> there's like an invasion plan and it's like supply lines to cut off in Pakistan. Yeah. <laughs> How'd you get this, Yogi? Shut up. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing a lot of uh, pro bono freelance editing work for the Indian government I can't talk about, <laughs> but just know there's a uh, blackout in Kashmir because of me. He's been doing drops for Modi's podcast. <laughs> you go into Yogi's room and it looks like there's a framed dip- diploma on the mm-hmm, wall, mm-hmm. but it actually just says the Urdu word for consensual sex is rape of young boys. <laughs> Not sure how you even got it framed like that, Yogi. But uh, they put up a fight. But yeah. I told them to do it, or I'd kill them. <clears throat> right. Well, then wouldn't it just be the Urdu word for rape of young boys? Nope. Shut up. Nope. <laughs> it's, those two words are interchangeable That's why in the Urdu language. The big sick. Guys. <laughs> That's why you don't. The, you got to read through the lines of these movies, dog. The Epstein conspiracy is the real big sick. <laughs> Um, all right, but so Aga Hassan Abadi, um, he moves to Karachi. He's originally in Lahore. He moves to Karachi. He sets up a BCCI in Luxembourg, 72. We've mentioned here it's exploding because of the oil boom. Um, uh, remittances from, you know, Pakistani migrant workers who go to the Gulf states. He gets all these deposits. He gets the oil money. Um, so he has this, like, amazing growth, but what really takes BCCI to the next level, as well as the Pakistani... Is inter- Facebook. As well as the Pakistani intelligence service, is um, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. You know, Christmas Day, uh, I believe, 1979, the Soviets invade Afghanistan. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what happens here is Jimmy Carter... Uh, is president originally, we boycott the Olympics, he starts a small-scale arms running to the Mujahideen, the resistance fighters, but it's really Ronald Reagan who comes in and What's says... What's the difference between a small-scale... Afghanistan scale? needs more money. <laughs> We've got 65.2 million tucked away in Zurich. What's the difference between a small-scale and a large-scale militia, or whatever you're saying? Just like... A couple pallets versus a couple... Right. Box trucks? Yeah. Dozens of pallets? Right. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's like when when you're actually counting the pal- palletfuls of $100 bills wh- or when you're just going like, yeah, this seems like enough. <laughs> <laughs> so when you can eyeball it versus right. when you have to weigh it. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, when you start having to weigh your money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Frank um, Abagnale <clears throat> method. But so we mentioned uh, the main source for this in the previous episode is the book The Outlaw Bank by Jonathan Beatty and S.C. Gwynn, uh, former Time Magazine correspondents. And they talk about um, uh, General Faisal Haq, F-A-Z-L-E-H-A-Q. Um, and he was, uh, uh, w- they quote, is uh, Washington's man in Pakistan. He was a, a lieutenant general in the Pakistani military, and he just so happened to be in 1978 appointed governor of Pakistan's northwest frontier province in 1978. So if you are the general who is appointed uh, the governor of the northwest province that just happens to have an entrance into Afghanistan, well, if the CIA wants to send uh, weapons and money into Afghanistan, they have to go through you. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, Frank Lucas. Frank Abagnale is the check catch me if you can guy. Frank Lucas is the American <laughs> gangster guy mm-hmm. that knew how much a million dollars was by weight. Mm. Oh, damn. I like that movie because it glorified Frank Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> Just this, like... It's like, what if we took, that movie was, what if we took Scarface, mm-hmm. but made Tony Montana even more relatable? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> the message of this movie is the fucking heroin dealer is a really cool, respectable guy. Yeah, yeah. And at the end, the guy investigating him uh, decides he's actually a good guy good after guy all. Too. Yeah, exactly. I Catch Me If You Can is kind of similar where, I mean, it's not a drug race that's going on, but it's fraud. And at the end, he's a good guy for the government which by the way this should be uh harrowing for our listeners and everyone that 
in this country, if you're a criminal mastermind, <laughs> at the end of the road, once you've paid your uh, time to society, the, the, the job you get is to work with our government to fleece everyone else now. Yeah, if you're going to be a criminal, uh, make sure you cultivate a skill set that's useful to the intelligence community. Yeah, right. Like, let's say uh, you're a pedophile... <laughs> And uh, just allegedly, right? Just uh, yeah. let's say you're allegedly a pedophile who allegedly ha- uh, hangs himself okay. in a prison where it's supposed to be impossible to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe uh, allegedly uh, market those skills to Mossad and the CIA. Right. The The key is if you are a pedophile, you should also take a community college vocational course <laughs> on hidden camera recording <laughs> because that is the difference between like 20 to life in a fucking prison where you're going to get shanked. <laughs> this and is sort of like the learn to code for pedophiles. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. <laughs> Just as long That's as you unemployed. can <laughs> secretly record this shit. Um, but so... Uh, Faisal Haq, again, the Pakistani general who's controlling this province, um, the authors of the Outlaw Bank have a high-level U.S. intelligence source that they identify as Condor throughout the book, and he gives this quote that I'm just going just gonna to read to you here. Uh, quote, the arms supplies for the Afghan rebels were being smuggled through his district, uh, Faisal Haq, the general's district, but everybody knew that Haq was also running the drug trade. BCCI was completely involved. We were working with the Pakistanis trying to slow it down, but we couldn't afford to expose it. Mm-hmm. And so this is what happens here, uh, you know, throughout the entire run of the Afghan war from like 79 to 88 or so when the Soviets finally withdraw, which is another interesting thing to note is that the collapse of BCCI does not occur until after the Soviets have withdrawn from Afghanistan. There's, you know, reports going all the way back to 78 about how BCCI is a fraud, needs to be shut down. Uh, we mentioned on the last episode over 700 tips to federal law enforcement uh, mm-hmm. throughout this time span saying, hey, BCCI is involved in a million illegal things. Right. But it's protected because they can't expose BCCI because then what they are doing arming the Mujahideen will be exposed. Right. We could trust Condor's candor. <laughs> <laughs> um but it is something where uh, this... Man, the intelligence community is just full of fake friends. <laughs> <laughs> this this operation here has so many fucking consequences. In addition to, you know, creating Al-Qaeda, uh, causing 9-11 eventually by setting up this network that's capable of carrying out these kinds of operations. In addition to that, uh, it makes the border regions of Pakistan, including Karachi, the city where um, uh, Abadi is based and where BCCI's Pakistan branch is primarily located, it makes the city extremely dangerous, and it also makes the border regions of Pakistan extremely dangerous because you've got billions of dollars flowing in as well as weapons, and Hawk is, of course, one of the main principles of the heroin trade. Because another thing that happens is, you know, there's the um, the Ayatollah Khomeini revolution in Iran. Iran starts cracking down, like, very harshly on heroin trafficking. Mm-hmm. So heroin trafficking primarily starts to go through Pakistan to the point where the outlaw bank says, uh, the book says 70% of the world's heroin started coming through Pakistan. Because How of dare network. those terrorist-encouraging Iranian leaders cut down on heroin trafficking? <laughs> But it is something where, you know, uh, we, we mentioned that quote there. The U.S. knew Hawk and other Pakistanis were involved in the heroin trade and making money from it. But we needed him to send our weapons and our pallets full of money into Afghanistan. So we looked the other way. Uh, so this creates a heroin epidemic in Pakistan, but it also creates one in the United States. We needed Hawk to help us solve the Laura Palmer murder and get us <laughs> the Black Lodge. <laughs> Why is it going to be black, Andy? Yeah. Um, but, you know, so that's just kind of the, the main story there. And we mentioned on the previous episode, ISI, the Pakistani intelligence, is skimming off the top of these billions of dollars of weapons and um, uh, uh, just pallets full of $100 bills that come into the country because the CIA's main role is dump the shit in Pakistan and then we give it to ISI or other couriers who bring it into Afghanistan. So, of course, they can do whatever they want with it. A lot of the weapons and money never even reaches its... Uh, supposed destination. And this is just entirely a predictable result of uh, the Reagan administration and the CIA under William Casey at the time uh, trying to skirt the uh, law of Congress and uh, public accountability. And in fact, I wanted to uh, play a drop from the NBC, um, NBC News report in 1992, which was 
I mean, the gist of it is that William Casey was the director of the CIA, and he was meeting directly with Aga Hassan Abadi, the founder of BCCI, this massive criminal enterprise, uh, for at least 1984 to 1986, usually like once a month. Really? Yeah. But what Bailey didn't know at the time was that the director of the CIA, William Casey, had his own secret BCCI agenda, using the corrupt bank for covert activity. Bailey now says that explains why others at the White House were in no hurry to go after BCCI. It's public knowledge now that the uh, Central Intelligence Agency used uh, the BCCI for certain of its payments. And uh, obviously doing that uh, would make them less than totally favorable to uh, blowing the uh, BCCI cover. What happened? The official line from the CIA, given in testimony before a Senate subcommittee last year by then acting CIA Director Richard Kerr, was that the CIA did not make great use of BCCI. BCCI was not a major banking mechanism used by the agency for the support of covert foreign intelligence operations. It was used on an extremely limited basis for legal banking transactions. But an investigation by NBC News over the last five months including interviews with former BCCI insiders, prosecutors, and foreign intelligence sources, has found that there is much, much more to the relationship between BCCI and the CIA than anyone in government has been willing to admit. An important part of the CIA-BCCI intrigue involves what BCCI sources say were secret meetings here at the Madison Hotel in Washington in one of the $2,000 a night presidential suites on the top floor of the hotel. According to BCCI sources, it was here that the head of the bank, Aga Hassan Abadi, met secretly for at least three years with CIA Director Casey. Sources say the secret meetings took place every few months, and the agenda involved... And the agenda involved uh, Pakistan, um, Afghanistan war primarily, as well as Iran-Contra. Um, but yes, thank God uh, all of the uh, news networks have cut their investigative journalism budgets. <laughs> well, so it was that all we, legal. Yes. It was minimal. Yes. Minimal banking transactions, and it was all legal. Yes, yeah. you heard the testimony. If it's minimal, it's legal. <laughs> But, you know, so the literal head of the CIA, William Casey, and, you know, he's a fascinating character where he comes in and doesn't even trust his own agency. He came after Helms, right? I believe so, yes. I think actually George H. No, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, It was George H. W. Bush, then Carter's guy, and then William Casey when Reagan comes in. Oh, okay. And then William Casey dies in 87, I believe. Wait, did uh, Bush come after Helms? No, Bush was before. Bush was the last Gerald Ford guy. Oh, no, but, I mean, Helms was, uh, he was, like, the 60s. He was, like, the guy who did all the, like, MKUltra shit. Okay, so my timeline's fucked up. But, yeah, so then George H.W. Bush came after Helms. But um, I guess my point there was William Casey comes in with Reagan, and Carter actually did lay off some CIA people, try to cut back, because this was in the aftermath of the the church committee, of course, you know, where they got exposed for all this bullshit, including MKUltra. Um, but so, uh, Casey comes in. But he didn't try to, let's say, shatter the CIA into a million different pieces. <laughs> yes, no. The, uh, and then go on uh, an open roof car ride through. Uh, That's the thing is like, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm with Matt Chrisman. I'm agnostic on was JFK killed by the CIA. Oh yeah, but it's fun to speculate. But you just can't help but notice that the last president to threaten to shut down the CIA just <laughs> happened to be assassinated and no president since then has tried to do that. Yeah, the thing that like I used to be worried that, you know, Bernie would completely lose and fall into irrelevance and that's still a possibility, but now that things are looking good for him now, I'm just really afraid of a coup. Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, he's old enough that if like he dies of whatever heart attack, you know, it's just the usual people will all be lecturing you. Commit suicide by jumping out of a window. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> With a blow to his head yeah. on LSD. Yeah. Jumped or fell. <laughs> <laughs> or fell, yeah. Immediately. But yeah, he's old enough that all the usual people will be like, you fucking conspiracy theorist. He was an old man. <laughs> yeah. he, you know, they die of uh, natural causes they all would, the time right after they win the New Hampshire oh, primary. They would, <laughs> they would bring out the heart attack gun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um. But so what I wanted to talk about here, and so, you know, William Casey, he wants to get around the agency. More than anything else, he wants to get around congressional oversight. Uh, 
uh, because so he sets up. Wait, so he doesn't trust the CIA, and also he wants to get around public oversight of the CIA. <laughs> yes, I mean, like he has people within there that he trusts, but he's he doesn't like that the bureaucracy in the aftermath of the Church Committee. A lot of people there were like, okay, let's go along with the Senate because the Church Committee did clip oh, their exactly. wings a little bit. Right. Where you know, again, the Senate uh, investigates, the Senate passes a law saying no more CIA assassinations. Aww. You know, uh, and so. Uh, William Casey doesn't like that there are a lot of people within the bureaucracy who are like, okay, we have, the, let's follow the law. I don't want to get in trouble. Right. So he's actually, William Casey is a former OSS agent, and he brings in this, his own network called the quote Hardy Boys, which are like <laughs> a bunch of old geezers he knows from the OSS. <laughs> like the what? Outlaw Bank, the book has like really funny descriptions of him, like just giving these old people secret <laughs> CIA technology and weapons and shit and just letting them walk out the door and like do <laughs> operations. Just completely off the books, no just oversight. Sure. A lot of uh, institutional knowledge on how to sabotage a zero. <laughs> the Outlaw Bank actually like quotes from the memoir of the leader of the French intelligence agency um, who apparently wrote this story in his memoir about meeting Ronald Reagan I believe either shortly after or shortly before he won the election and telling Reagan don't trust the CIA you know there's like a lot of amateurs or fools over there and so uh, he's I'm sure he retained that yeah Uh, he uh, this guy this leader of the French intelligence becomes a guy who like William Casey and um, Ronald Reagan rely on to the point where he pitches them on in the Afghan war uh, you guys should use drugs that you have seized off the streets of America and then dump them into Kabul to get the Soviet troops addicted to drugs. <laughs> and they're like really excited about this operation, but then it doesn't go forward. But it's foolish anyways, because there's so much heroin in Afghanistan already. Yeah, right. It would happen. But it's just one of those things like they give the the outlaw bank gives this description of William Casey hearing the idea and getting so pumped up and like getting up off his, <laughs> his desk and like pacing around all excited, you know. So it was something where Ronald Reagan and William Casey were really interested in these operations to uh, defeat the Soviet Union by any means necessary. Because another thing the book alleges, I think very credibly, is that um, with Jimmy Carter, and we'll, we'll go through this in a second here, there was some pretty substantial bribery to uh, associates of Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter himself, uh, at least in the form of charitable donations to his foundation. But um, but with Ronald Reagan, there was less of that overtly, though there was still, but it was more just the people there believed so firmly that any means necessary to defeat the Soviet Union that BCCI could just say, yeah, we're doing what the U.S. Congress won't let you do mm. to stop the Soviet Union. Yeah, The CIA... Uh, kind of responds like in that in that committee hearing their response like they try to downplay the significance of like well we didn't even really need access to BCCI it was right. just a few minor ex- like they were like they're really downplaying what was like basically their only link into the formal international banking system because otherwise what are you going to do you're going to have to go the pallets of money route <laughs> in order to finance all of these weapons and training. It's also and it's just like it's like infinitely more uh places that a clandestine operation could fail if you don't have access to just the regular banking system. Right, right. It's also kind of funny. I forget if it's Richard Kerr or William Casey. I think it's Richard Kerr actually. Uh the CIA director um is originally the CIA is saying we never had any accounts with BCCI. And then it comes out, and um, he what he does is he gives a press conference to middle schoolers hmm. so that nobody will a- ask him hostile questions. <laughs> and then he admits, yes, we had some limited accounts with BCCI, but it was all above board. <laughs> and that's kind of the extent of what the CIA admitted. And in fact, we have a drop from a person from the Kerry Committee, because the Kerry Committee is kind of what starts to blow this open, because John... My Ke- wife... <laughs> John Kerry has actually some good investigators on his his subcommittee, but there's there's one drop of them getting the runaround from the CIA, which just kind of shows you how uh, impossible congressional oversight of the CIA is. CIA takeover of for bank. We went down to Langley. We asked for a briefing by the CIA on everything it knew about a BCCI, again at the top secret level. They provided a briefer to us, who was unfamiliar with the name. Kamal at home. Intelligence on uh, such things. It was absolutely it's obvious to us we weren't getting the full story. Weapons proliferation. Right, this is what the agency said. So Kamal Adham, again, we talked about this in the last episode, 
head of Saudi intelligence from 1965 to 1979. So they, the CIA provided Kerry's committee with a briefer who had no idea who the head of Saudi intelligence was. And again, this in the present, there's really, except for the, uh, the torture investigation, there's been no oversight of the CIA. Right. But, I, don't like, you know, I don't like what I read about them. <laughs> it just shows you how, what a joke congressional oversight of this agency has become to the point where Look, I do think the CIA has at minimum tertiary links to child trafficking and probably more explicit in the case of Jeffrey Epstein. But, you know, if you say that shit, people are just like, oh, it's a conspiracy. But the thing is, how could we fucking know? There is no oversight here. This is an agency that has become a government unto itself. And uh, you just listen to a, a staffer for John Kerry say that when they tried to find shit out, they just sent them a fake briefer and just constantly deceived and minimized them. And, and uh, again, they did the same thing with all the torture investigations. And there's no consequences. No CIA people go to jail. And even the Iran-Contra prosecutions were all pardoned on the way out. Sean, it sounds to me like you're uh, talking about a shadow government and I don't know if you know this but that is actually an anti-Semitic trope <laughs> yeah and Sean that's also black so I don't know why you keep blaming the blacks on this mm -hmm. what uh, shadow yeah yeah yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> okay. saying shadows are black <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I guess what I wanted to do here is just read a little bit from um, the Outlaw Bank and this former member of the Black Network uh, <sighs> again with the blacks Sean he he gives this um, uh, this statement to uh, the the journalist who wrote the Outlaw Bank, and he goes through a few different things. And I just wanted to start with uh, Mossad. They ask him uh, to tell them what he knows about the Mossad and the BCCI Black Network. Again, this is the intelligence arm of BCCI with about fifteen hundred members, according to the book. Uh, he says about Mossad, What do you want to know? We trained together in Karachi for covert operations. We gathered information for the Mossad, spying on the Gulf states because we were so close to the ruling families there that we were familiar with foreign policies. The Israelis sold U.S. arms technology expertise to Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, and BCCI brokered the deals. BCCI would loan money to the countries for the purchases, but some of it that came to Pakistan was a gift. And uh, they talk about that. They talk about, uh, he gives this quote to, uh, uh, the CIA was doing things for us and we were doing things for the agency. We picked people up for them. We assassinated people for the agency. We were big in drugs, drug smuggling, and drug financing. Um, another kind of fascinating thing he talks about, uh, he says, BCCI's motives was to strengthen its ties to the agencies, all the various intelligence agencies. We were looking to the future, but it wasn't all tied to arms. Once there was a shipment from Colombia via Fiji and Manila to Karachi by ship. The network unloaded it in Karachi. A CIA agent from Indiana named Steve was in charge, and we had to get it out of the port using trucks to the airport where we loaded it onto an unmarked 707. I was there. I carried the money to give to Karachi Customs. The payoff to the Customs was half a million rupees, which is about 25,000 U.S. dollars. I knew that supervisor. He asked to take the night ship that night because something was coming in. I don't know what the shipment was. It was huge wooden crates. We had to use a crane instead of the forklift. Hmm. Um, and they ask him if he knows what was in the shipments. Um, I like that there's an unmarked 707, like they bought a 707 and then filed off the serial number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he says he doesn't know what was in the shipment. Uh, this was around uh, April 1989. Right off Craigslist. Yeah. So April eight, uh, 1989, he doesn't know what's in the ship, and he says, the plane left Karachi going over Turkey and Iran, and they got Air Pakistan to abort a scheduled flight at the last minute, so this plane would appear to be Air Pakistan, but then it diverted to Czechoslovakia. I heard its final destination was the east coast of the United States, somewhere between Virginia and Vermont. They ask him again, uh, what do you think was in the crates? I don't know. We moved gold. We moved guns. We moved drugs. This shipment started in Colombia. So you can speculate as to what would be in this shipment that ended up somewhere on the east coast of the United States with a CIA guy named Steve overseeing it. But it is very possibly uh, cocaine trafficking from Colombia with the uh, oversight of the CIA to get money for their black ops. Or gold or guns. Who the fuck knows? Sure. Anything when you think about it, literally, including butt, especially butt, really, when you yeah. think about it. Yeah. 
Steve's like silently hoping we don't figure <laughs> out it was him. <laughs> He's, he had uh, much the older than that look, actually. <laughs> He had the fucking Pakistan black mm-hmm. mission, and then his uh, next job was to infiltrate leftist podcasts. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, we, we have to use a pseudonym so that my job doesn't find out I work here. I, I peel off the skin under my nose, and there's a mustache underneath it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so this, this former agent of BCCI tells a bunch of different horrifying stories. He mainly says in within Pakistan, BCCI would mainly do intimidation. Again, they were so connected to the ISI, Pakistani military, that if they just threatened you, you would fall in line for the most part. But he does tell a story about a BCCI man they discovered uh, who was liquidating his assets and fleeing the country. And he gives a quote, uh, they got brigands from the Northwest. They came in and raped his wife and killed his brother along with him. Uh, and he said that was the uh, only assassination within Pakistan he knew about. But he did hear rumors of CIA assassinations. And he says, quote, we helped them in Southeast Asia, Burma, and Hong Kong. So. They helped the CIA assassinations? Yes. They're saying they, BCCI had agents there who would do assassination for the CIA. Because, again, there is officially a Senate ban on CIA assassination. Which is impossible to find a workaround. <laughs> right. After BCCI goes under, they're trying to get jobs at other banks. Mm-hmm. It's like, so um, uh, what what qualifies you to work at Bank of America? What banking experience do you have? Well, uh, I, I, I've done a lot of assassinations. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can use that. <laughs> I'm a procurer. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one, one last quote from this uh, uh, black uh, network guy uh, from BCCI. Always a black guy with you, Sean. Why has it got to be black? Uh, he says, quote, there were lots of Americans on the payroll. These were the people we had gotten to through blackmail, extortion, bribery. There were judges, state policemen, the FBI, the Justice Department. In the U.S., it was always money. You give a guy a loan and he didn't have to pay it back. And they talk about part of his job for BCCI, uh, as well as, you know, intelligence gathering and these kinds of things, was he would put, say, 100000 or whatever the amount is, just put it in somebody's bank account. So you don't even offer them a bribe. You just put 100000 in their bank account, and then they're left with a dilemma. Oh, do I return this money, or do I just keep my mouth shut? Right, and right. then you own them right away. And, you know, again, we mentioned this on the last episode. He is the one who claims that Senator John Tower, who wrote the uh, Tower Commission report on Iran-Contra, uh, they blackmailed him with uh, probably underage girls from Lahore and got videos and film. So, again, no... <clears throat> No possible overlinks <laughs> with the Epstein scandal. No, uh, not at all. And I don't know BCCI, why you suggest that, Sean. BCCI training with the Mossad <laughs> and uh, unloading drugs <laughs> over the overs- uh, under the oversight of CIA agents and shit. We can talk a bit here about another depressing topic, which is BCCI's role in trafficking. We've kind of hinted at this a lot. Their lending practices. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You will never believe the fucking leverage ratio these people were getting. <laughs> Can you up believe to. these people were using BCCI shares by the from their major shareholders <laughs> as collateral? Oh, I can believe that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we just like get so disgusted we can't do a comedy <laughs> podcast anymore. Um but so, you know, look, uh Sheikh Zayed. Um, and also his son, who now, uh, Sheikh Zayed has since died. His son now runs the United Arab Emirates. His son, I believe Khalid, um, has a reputation as a playboy. Uh, you know, they talk about how he would like party in London and shit. And again, this, this DJ guy. DJ Khalid. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Khalifa. Prince Khalifa, now the uh, leader of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, he had a reputation as a playboy. Um, Wiz and, Khalifa. Yes. And... <laughs> Again, the BCCI says you. Uh, there's no way to discuss commercial matters with uh, these kind of um, people in the royal courts. You just talk to them about camels or you bring them girls. He also talks about bringing cocaine or young boys to various people in the um, in the uh, royal families. But what's kind of disturbing here is there is something within BCCI called the quote-unquote protocol department. And uh, according to the book... And th- their job is... Why are you laughing, Stephen? <laughs> they develop a lot of protocols Yeah, there's a book the with years. protocols. What's so funny about that? Yeah, Stephen, I don't it's, know what you're getting at here. So tell us about this book the elders wrote. Um, it's really disturbing the financial protocols the protocol department came up <laughs> with. 
And that's what's really disgusting if about If you follow this protocol, you don't have anything to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the quote-unquote protocol department, their job is essentially entertaining VIPs for BCCI. And according to the book, The Outlaw Bank, when BCCI opened in Karachi in 1978, this is after the coup and they're allowed back in Pakistan again. When they open in Karachi in 1978, the protocol department was already in place with a 1.5 million U.S. dollar budget and over 100 employees. It would grow to about 500 employees. Oh, what year was this? 1978. Oh, that's the year Kumail Nanjiani was born in Karachi. <laughs> it was... The uh, the dancing boy Camille Nalgiani. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what they would do is um, again, it's very disturbing here. But what they would do is they would uh, go to what are called the uh, quote unquote diamond markets. It's uh, like his his honest like how I became a comedian. Well, I, I discovered as a dancing boy I, I could. Did you try really to do a Camille accent and then it just <laughs> dropped immediately? Yeah. <laughs> Um. So, yeah. So they would go to the diamond markets and just quoting from the book, uh, the entertainment provided yeah, by... Yeah, I want to fuck that one. Just do the heroin. <laughs> <laughs> quoting from the book, they would go to the diamond markets and uh, the entertainment provided by BCCI, uh, quoting from the book, it had always meant such things as bustard hunts. Those are the, uh, the hen-like, <laughs> the turkey-like animals that you hunt with the falcons. <laughs> Uh, and camel races, but now the entourages of Middle Eastern uh, leaders, in particular that of Zaid of the U United Arab Emirates, were increasingly being entertained in less wholesome ways. Much of this sort of amusement took place in Lahore's legendary diamond market, home of the famous quote-unquote dancing girls. There, girls as young as 12, and later even younger, were dressed in silk harem pants and procured by BCCI officers for their clients. In the middle 1970s, the man in charge of inspecting the girl was Zafar Iqbal, who would later become the CEO of BCCI. Mm. Um, inspecting? Yes. <laughs> yeah, because okay. they, they go to these markets and they inspect the girls. And the, the way it's described later on is they have later the, the wife of some doctor who's connected to BCCI uh, checking out the girls uh, throughout. <laughs> yeah, they, they describe... She's all right. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I think uh, maintenance yeah. on this is good. Seven. Uh, Strong seven. Why is she? Why is she the wife of a doctor? Doesn't she have her own thing going? Yes, <laughs> she's like Ben Shapiro. She just can't shut the fuck up about how her husband is a doctor. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Uh, so, quoting from the book again, uh, Bigam Asghari Rahim, the wife of a Pakistani doctor, was in charge of rounding up the girls and bringing them to Karachi to be outfitted in proper clothes before being presented to the princely clients. Often, she would shepherd more than 50 girls at a time through a department store, shopping for jewelry and dresses. The practice was so successful, far more effective than giving away microwave ovens or toasters, that the bank would spend as much as $100,000 U.S. dollars on such an evening's entertainment. According to Senate testimony, um, uh, she would also, quote, interview girls and women and take them to Abu Dhabi for a dancing show or arrange some singing shows throughout the Middle East. Quote, dancing girls and singing girls are euphemisms for prostitutes. Um, and we have mentioned the Kerry Committee took testimony about how women uh, who were prepubescent were physically harmed by uh, being raped by uh, members of the Saudi, the UAE royal family. Among yeah. others. But uh, one last thing on this that is particularly disturbing to me. Jimmy Carter. So uh, Cy Vance, you might know Cy Vance Jr. as the uh, ineffectual <laughs> Manhattan district attorney who gave a pass to the Trump kids as well as to Harvey Weinstein, which, um, you know, uh, uh, Morgenthau, the uh, district attorney that preceded him was by no means perfect, but he is the guy who uh, investigated BCCI and brought this whole thing down. So it is quite the uh, drop in quality, one of the uh, most kind of Godfather 2 to Godfather 3 <laughs> uh, political transitions in history to go from uh, Robert Morgenthau to uh, Cy Vance Jr. But Cy Vance's father, Cy Vance, was the Secretary of State for Jimmy Carter. Oh, and really? before that, he uh, he got his first big government gig, uh, according to Seymour Hersh, just lying to the Pentagon press corps about Vietnam. Like, as, as Hersh told it in his memoir, uh, Robert McNamara and Cy Vance would just kind of walk into the room, tell the press corps a bunch of easily uh, checked lies, and then uh, the press corps would just kind of happily write it down. Wow. 
It's yeah. so fucked up that Trump is the first president to lie to the <laughs> press <laughs> just constantly. Yeah, he should listen to the uh, the honest generals. <laughs> so Cy Vance was uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's secretary of state. And according to the book, The Outlaw Bank, uh, before Jimmy Carter visited Pakistan, Cy Vance secretly visited Pakistan. And kind of a disturbing thing is that both Jimmy Carter and Cy Vance on their official trips to Pakistan, according to the book, quote, had been hosted by BCCI's protocol department rather than Pakistani officials. Hmm. I would assume, or at least I would hope, the entertainment was slightly different from what the protocol department was offering to the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we didn't have girls like this on the peanut farm. <laughs> well, uh, that's the other thing, which we'll actually get to right here. But, you know, it, it kind of goes to show you where Carter leaves office and then BCCI gives him at least $10 million for his charitable foundation. Carter's budget director, his former budget director... Um, it was a guy named uh, uh, Bertram Lance. He had to resign as Carter's budget director. He got in financial problems. He was, I believe, the half owner of the National Bank of Georgia. Hmm. Um, BCCI buys it from him using front people at a premium to kind of essentially get him in pocket where you're in desperate financial straits. We'll buy your bank, which not only gives BCCI a foothold in the American market, but also gives him money and makes him, you know, their patsy now. Right, right. But in addition to that, uh, according to the book, The Outlaw Bank, the National Bank of Georgia was the largest lender to Jimmy Carter's peanut farm. <laughs> so BCCI was also the largest lender to Jimmy Carter's peanut farm. And uh, Man, they love nuts. Yes. I didn't know he still had a peanut farm when he was president. Yeah, yeah. like, didn't he have to, like... He, he was forced to give it up because it would be Similar conflicting. Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, he did have to give it up, but I think he got it back after his presidency. Oh, so then they peanut lent it to his blind, peanut farm when he went back. Trust. <laughs> yeah. <Blind> peanut trust. <laughs> you know what Trump so was supposed to do, but instead chose to <laughs> uh, circumvent and do a couple of loopholes around that shit. Yeah, okay, Sean, but how does this tie to Russia? <laughs> yeah, come on, Sean. But so, yes, they, uh, they buy in 1977. Uh, Bertram Lance meets uh, uh, representatives from BCCI. They um, give him a $3.4 million loan, and they buy the National Bank of Georgia from him. Uh, and, of course, uh, in addition to that, in 1982, after Carter leaves office, he starts meeting uh, Abadi, the founder of BCCI. He starts meeting him in person, flying around the world with him, and we played on the first uh, part of this, the quote about Jimmy Carter saying, you know, Abadi is a decent man and BCCI is a unique bank among all of the ones. I have never seen a protocol department this efficient and uh, with uh, this many employees. But so... It, Wonderful dancing. Yes. <laughs> and so I guess we'll kind of uh, close... I guess they did have dancers like that on the peanut farm later. Yes. I guess we'll kind of stop this here because, you know, we've, we've gone through the Afghan war, we've gone through trafficking, we've gone through a fair bit of CIA links, links to Jimmy Carter. Um, what I want to talk about on the next and last part will be, we'll go through the fall of BCCI and then we'll go through some of Whitney Webb's and uh, others' allegations about what has happened with regards to Jeffrey Epstein, possible BCCI links. And also just we should mention here that according to the book, The Outlaw Bank, at least 16 people were died in suspicious circumstances during the BCCI investigation. Really? They do lay out very clearly uh, two journalists who were um, very clearly, in my mind, murdered. Uh, I mean, journalists just die. It's part of the job. Yeah. I, I like how it's the, the term you're using is mysterious. Like, it turns out <laughs> that next to his hotel room was a vat of quicksand no one saw coming. <laughs> is this higher rate than the baseline mysterious death <laughs> <laughs> for, for journalists? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what's the what's the vig on this death on journalism? Yeah, you know it's uh it's kind of mysterious when a journalist gets shot to death with a silence pistol and then his notes disappear <laughs> out of his hotel. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's a Financial Times journalist named Anson Ning uh, who is killed in Guatemala over BCCI. Uh, he was investigating BCCI in Guatemala for the Financial Times. Uh, you might be aware there was a genocide in Guatemala, but BCCI's standard uh, modus operandi was to help elites in various countries funnel money out 
Uh, so, you know, whatever aid or uh, IMF loans or whatever the fuck it might be, they just help the ruling government uh, uh, squirrel a whole bunch of it out into Cayman Islands accounts. So you can see why if he's in Guatemala, uh, somebody might want investigating this for the Financial Times, somebody might want to shoot him. And he's murdered in his apartment uh, with a silenced pistol. His notes are taken and uh, a, a towel is wrapped around his head. To apparently prevent the wow, blood racist. from uh, to prevent the blood, yeah. it was not that kind of message. It was, I guess, to prevent the blood from leaking out. That just That's sounds like a stand- sounds like a standard mugging. You know, when you've got a lot of notes, you just become a target for uh, muggers. The street value of Financial Times notes is <laughs> like fifteen million dollars. Oh, man, I saw this guy. He bought like three notebooks the other this day. Guy. <laughs> Let's roll up on him, man. He's got like four n- moleskins <laughs> in his pocket right now. If you're you're walking through Jamaica, Queens, people will just be like, fire notes. <laughs> <laughs> Financial Times. Financial Times business notes. <laughs> Empty notes, yeah. Empty notes. Guy, I saw this guy open up his Financial Times subscription with a fingerprint. <laughs> oh, shit, man. Excuse me, I, I got all these uh, Financial Times notes that I just need to unload. I just got too many, if you could. <laughs> Yo, man, you can't say that on the street, dog. Someone's going to rob us. <laughs> Uh, and then the other reporter is Danny Casalaro, who um, you might be, he's kind of an obsession of various um, conspiracy bloggers. And I think the suspicious, the circumstances of his death are extremely suspicious. He was an independent journalist. He's found dead in his West Virginia hotel room in 1991. Uh, just so happens one of his last entries, the last entry in his notebook is to call one of the authors of the book, The Outlaw Bank. Oh, wow. So uh, he was investigating what he called, quote unquote, the octopus, which he said involved BCCI, involved Iran-Contra, and also involved this promise software, which we don't have time to get too much into. Maybe we'll talk a little more on the next episode, but it's this really weird story about this guy who wrote software for the Department of Justice and later got into a long legal battle where he says they and possibly Israeli intelligence sold his software and then the conspiracy or the allegation is that they put a back door in it and started selling it around the world so that they could oh, uh, really? steal information out of this. But so, so they uh, put a butt on it and started yeah. doing butt stuff with the rest of the world. And clearly he got assassinated by the second rate squad because his notes were still in the <laughs> Yeah, right. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> they, they killed him, but they didn't grab his notes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so The shit that we really need. So we'll maybe talk a little bit more about Danny Casalaro on the next and last part of this, but you should just know that um, you can look at the photos of his wrist wounds online. He was found dead in the bathtub, supposedly ruled a suicide, slashed his own wrists. Uh, his family said that he spent his entire life with a like really... Uh, vicious fear of blood mm-hmm. and bleeding. So they'd say, you know, if he did that, he wasn't going to do it that way. Right, right. Uh, you can look on the photos. Um, uh, they're disturbing, but he's got really deep cuts all over his wrists. Oof. Like to the point where, like, if you're just going to open up your veins and die in, in, in the bathtub, it really shouldn't look like that. It's like really fucking deep. Hmm. Um, and he also talked about... His also down the road, or er, also across the street, not down the road. Yes, he talked about this, uh, um, or his housekeeper, among others, have talked about how he was getting threatening phone calls. He told his brother, if something happens to me, it was not a suicide, you know. Oh, well. Is he, like his That's house- what everyone says before they kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> like somebody... But the notes, Sean, yes. did he leave any notes? His people have looked at some of the... Like, some of his notes were taken, but some of them were still there. Mm, half uh, They wrote, like, some weird, uh, nonsensical suicide note on the hotel uh, paper. And um, and I guess just, uh, well, one quote from the book, his housekeeper testified that um, she, like, picked up the phone at his, at his house. The nonsensical hotel notes are like, although my fear of blood persisted throughout my life, <laughs> at these final moments, I'm coming to terms with my fears. I can just imagine, like, the news reports that are like, the suicide note says, uh, I cannot enjoy writing music anymore. <laughs> and then the assassin's at home is like, shit. I don't know if the Cobain know it. <laughs> <laughs> this is, it sounds like amateur hour. Right, yeah. right. And it's on, you said it was on the hotel stationery. Yeah, it's yeah. not even. It's just like the Marriott. It's not even good stock. <laughs> <laughs> logo behind it. What you're knowing on like some good papyrus. Well, at least they put them in the bathtub so it wasn't a big mess. So like just a couple more things from this. Uh, the housekeeper says she like picked up the phone at his house and she got multiple death threats, one of which was, we're going to cut you up and throw your body to the sharks. And then the person on the other line hung up. 
uh, she you would also get the silent uh, phone calls. Um, there have been uh, multiple Freedom of Information Act requests related to his investigation, one of which was finally uh, declassified in 2017, though the FBI's claimed they lost a lot of pages related to this. Mm. But what was declassified, the, the FBI agents investigating this, more than half of them said they suspected this was not a suicide, but felt pressure from above to uh, close out this investigation. Mm. And then if I can just uh, quote from the outlaw bank to uh, uh, close out this part of the story, uh, he had supposedly killed himself by slashing his wrists, except that the cuts had been phenomenally deep all the way through the tendons. There was also evidence that someone else had been in the room with him. Quote, it looked like someone tried to wipe up the blood on the floor and slid the towels under the sink, one of the motel's housekeepers said in a magazine interview. It looked like someone threw the towels on the floor and tried to wipe the blood with their foot, but they didn't get the blood. They just smeared it on the floor. Yeah, they are pretty deep. I mean, I saw the pictures and they're pretty deep on like both wrists. And if it's going to the tendon, I don't think you would have the strength in your hand to hold a knife and do the other wrist. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Those are very deep cuts. Yeah. Yeah. You can believe or disbelieve this, but uh, Whitney Webb and Mint, Mint Press, she writes about in 1994, um, one of uh, uh, Danny Casalaro's lawyers, uh, or no, an Inslaw lawyer that's related to the uh, Promise software lawsuit, uh, this lawyer, Charles Work, told then Assistant Attorney General John Dewey that one of Inslaw's confidential sources in the government had stated that Casalaro had been injected with a substance that deadened his nerves from the neck down, explaining the apparent lack of struggle and that the substance used had come from the U.S. Army inventory. The last person who had arranged Casalaro's final meeting oh, cool before that the army has that. <laughs> the last person who had arranged Casalaro's final meeting before his death was a U.S. military intelligence officer named Joseph Kuehler. C U E L L A R. Kuehler. Yes. <laughs> um. So I guess we'll close out the story on the next episode. But I do want to just make clear to anyone listening who might not be uh let's say sympathetic to our interests we don't do any invi- original reporting no. on this podcast no, no, no. so we just take what other journalists say and then we play annoying right. sound effects over it well that's the grub sticker way yes and i mean you know if you want new dirt yes you gotta you gotta pay more than five ten fifteen dollars you gotta directly paypal us Minimum seventy to ninety thousand dollars. That's how you're going to get the goods. Yes. So if you're listening to this and you have the documents confirming that uh, Casalaro was injected with a nerve agent, just send them to the Guardian because <laughs> we are not trying to get injected with a nerve agent and then have our wrist cut in a bathtub and be unable to resist. Um. And at this time of recording, none of us are currently suicidal. Yes. Uh. Nah. Okay. <laughs> but you know. Ish. Whenever we finish the recording, we like to take LSD and hit ourselves in the head <laughs> just to celebrate another job yeah. well done. Yeah. So right. if that's what happens to us, I mean, it was natural causes. Sure, exactly. Hit ourselves in the head about a week or two later <laughs> <laughs> while on a, a week-long retreat with the government trying to, quote, diagnose our condition. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we will uh, come back with part three uh, on the Patreon side. We will close out the story of BCCI and we'll talk a little bit about some of the other possible conspiracies, including the Finders Cult and the Franklin Credit scandal. And with that, this has been Yogi Paywall. <laughs> All right. Sean P. McCarthy, thanks for listening. Andy Palmer. Steve Jeffers. To quote Montesquieu, power without knowledge is power lost. I, I want to be held accountable for what I'm doing. You know, this may sound like an, an exaggeration, but it was like the 9-11 of my career and certainly of making kombucha. Jesus is smart. This idea of income inequality, that always strikes me as a very, it's a deceptive term, income inequality. Well, let's flip it around. It comes from outcome inequality. In I four. Three, I got the loot, Steve. Welcome back to Grub Stakers Premium. We are here with you uh, for the last, the third and last part of our look at the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. Who knows? We might do several more. Yes. Uh, <laughs> fucking the last part because we're all going to get killed after we leave the <laughs> studio. Yeah, this is the big one where uh, just as we're reaching the climax and dramatic conclusions, we all shoot ourselves in the back of the head. <laughs> You guys hear this music coming on in the background? What's going on here? Yeah.
Um, so what we haven't talked about yet, we, we left you on the previous episode. We talked about um, BCCI and how it expanded because of, you know, covert uh, arms and money given to the, uh, the Afghan Mujahideen with the Soviet invasion, how BCCI officers in the ISI, which are almost one and the same, were able to skim, you know, billions off the top of that. Uh, and how they expanded because of petrodollars as well. Uh, but what we haven't talked about is their forays into the American market. Because BCCI was a petrodollar bank. They mm -hmm. were doing the banking for the UAE. Um, they had some Saudi clients as well, but mainly for the UAE. Billions of dollars in petrodollars. So BCCI was set up in London. They were set up all around the world, but they didn't have an official branch in the United States. And it was interesting where the Federal Reserve, we, we've talked about this on previous parts, the um, comptroller of the currency, a, a lower person there, did an audit of BCCI in 1978 and said, this is a fraud, this thing cannot be allowed to own a U.S. bank. Right. So BCCI makes two attempts to buy a U.S. bank, which are both rejected, and then they finally get lucky with their third one. And um, I believe we actually have some, some music, in fact, the sound of what a BCCI bank in America sounds like. American. <laughs> you can bank with us. <laughs> uh, imagine being there in the recording studio. Yeah. <laughs> like you're in the the chorus. I guess. Yeah. Right, right. And there's like the male soloist that goes this <laughs> Imagine being one of those singers and you open up the paper and it's like first American shut down for fraud and you're like, well, there go those royalty checks. <laughs> <laughs> you can blackmail senators. <laughs> With video of <laughs> underage girls, <laughs> you can finance terrorism. <laughs> Money off of crimes in America. Kill a journalist. So, um, for uh, the the history of uh, BCCI attempting to enter the U.S. market, they start out with. Um, Andy's line was just kill a journalist. <laughs> it, well, they did. it wasn't even about baking. <laughs> that would be great if it was like that. We didn't. You can't see the commercial, but if you do, it's actually a guy walking into an apartment in Guatemala <laughs> and shooting a Financial right. Times journalist. <laughs> First American bank. You can't kill a FT journalist. Right. We tried to find the actual commercial, but we couldn't. We, the clip is from the Frontline documentary where we've gotten a lot of our drops for these last few parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of uh, that uh, eye patch woman whistling and uh, kill Bill, you just she's actually whistling the first American bank <laughs> thing that she goes into the... <laughs> So um, uh, BCCI, they were originally working with um, Bertram Lance, who was, again, Jimmy Carter's former budget director, part owner of the National Bank of Georgia. Uh, he's working with them to try and help BCCI buy the bank that would eventually be renamed First America, First American Bank. Um, they try twice, BCCI does, both times they're rejected, where they have, you know, BCCI fronts who go in and say, Yes, BCCI is putting up the money for us, but BCCI is not going to control this bank. Uh, not at all. And um, the Fed says, no, fuck that. BCCI is a fraud. We do not want to allow them into the U.S. banking system. But what they do is on their third attempt, they are successful at buying First American. They take it over in 1981. Um, they, uh, it was called Financial General. They rename it uh, First American. And they're finally successful because they hire a guy named Clark Clifford. And you may not have heard of Clark Clifford. I hadn't before this episode. Clark Clifford is one of the like giant red dogs. Too. <laughs> Great name. He's uh, one of these uh, you know behind the scenes guys in Washington who. Um, He's a guy who has a real name. Yes, he's one of these behind the scenes guys in Washington who who do have so much power, and you never really hear about them unless they really fuck up, like he did with BCCI. But another thing that I found interesting about Clark Clifford is he was one of the top aides to President Harry Truman. He'd been in various Democratic in administrations for decades. He was one of the top aides to Harry Truman and also the co-author of the National Security Act of 1947, which created the CIA and the National Security Council. Oh, those are great organizations. Yes. Yeah, so uh, if we haven't hopefully established any... <laughs> If we haven't established enough CIA connections, just remember that the guy who created the CIA would go on to become the uh, chairman and CEO of First American Bank. And in fact, in that jingle we played for you, if you watch the commercial, Clark Clifford appears in it. Oh, briefly. really? 
Is he a singer? <laughs> yeah, he's, he does backing vocals. <laughs> Uh, so Clark Clifford, he's uh, a top aide to Harry Truman. He co-authors the National Security Act 1947. And then he leaves the White House and becomes a lawyer slash lobbyist. He basically sells out post-Truman administration. He starts doing, you know, uh, consulting for all of the big names or m- most of the big names in uh, corporate America, right. uh, lobbying their concerns primarily to Democratic administrations. But he's he's a very interesting figure where he's, an informal advisor to, you know, Kennedy and LBJ and uh, all these different people, while at the same time just uh, completely cashing out on his Washington connections. Um, but he uh, he's the one who, in 1981, Clark Clifford meets with the Fed, the Federal Reserve, to defend BCCI's takeover of First American Bank. He says that him and his partner, uh, I believe Robert Altman was his partner at his law firm, he says that they will run First American Bank totally independent of BCCI. Hmm. Um, and then uh, it becomes clear, and they are later. I'm just now imagining that like song over footage of just Contras mowing down civilians. <laughs> right. <laughs> And just like put that over <laughs> footage of fucking mustard gas from the Iran Iraq War. <laughs> Um, but so uh, Clark Clifford would later be charged by Robert Morgenthau, uh, as well as the Federal uh, Justice Department, uh, for lying to the Federal Reserve because it was a felony for BCCI to take over First American uh, Bank. It was a violation of U.S. banking law. Um, and, and that's he- where this clip from uh, way back uh, an episode and a half ago came from uh, when uh, Congress, they claimed that they uh, had nothing to do with BCCI as First American Bank, and that was when a uh, senator said, uh, The sum total of this committee's investigation is that you have been in bed with BCCI for at least 10 years. You're telling us all you got was a back rub. <laughs> um, but yes, Clark Clifford got a little more than a back rub. He, uh, <laughs> Salute to that guy's delivery, by the way. Very <laughs> underplayed. <laughs> According to the outlaw bank, Clark Clifford and his partner Altman, uh, they cleared at least $32 million from BCCI in uh, just under two years. Nice. So they, they made a lot of money. But he kind of went a bridge too far, though he eventually would just plead out and pay a fine uh, for quote-unquote health reasons. He died, <laughs> he died in, I believe, 97. Uh, he's charged in 91. He eventually just pleads out and pays a fine. Um, but you know he is dragged before Congress. And I hope you're he, saying. I had hoped you were saying bleed out. <laughs> <laughs> he he dies of a naturally occurring bullet to the back of the head. Oh, those occur all the time for journalists. Yeah, yeah, it's a common issue. Writer's block, <laughs> bullet to the head, <laughs> jaundice. Yeah, it's um, called a, a journalist's flu. Yes. <laughs> but so uh, Clark Clifford is you know the a huge lobbyist in Washington. He he represents BCCI's interests very well, um, particularly with you know various Democrats who might be skeptical of uh, a Republican administration. Uh, he represents BCCI very well. And um, another thing that happens is yeah, we don't want to slander his representation. <laughs> no, 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 not here. Uh, so there's also a Saudi uh, named Gaith Farion, uh, uh, P-H-A-R-A-O-N. Uh, and I, I'm just bringing him up because him, along with uh, Kamal Adham, the Saudi intelligence chief, and a couple others, they were the BCI fronts, mm. where BCCI said, these Saudis and other businessmen, these are the money. This is not you know, a BCCI thing, even right. though they were getting all these loans and give, being given the cash by BCCI. But why I bring up uh, Farion is um, he was a former Saudi billionaire who got wiped out in the oil crash, mm-hmm. but then BCCI used him as a front billionaire, mm. where BCCI gave him like at least $500 million and had them him act as their representative and i don't know where have you heard a story of a guy getting 500 million dollars out of nowhere an inexplicable billionaire uh representing the interests of others who perhaps do not want themselves at front and center elon musk yes (laughs) jeffrey epstein yes But I guess, you know, the story of First American is this is a very successful BCCI front. Apparently, uh, Clark Clifford would fly to, I believe, London and meet with Abadi at least once a month, and Abadi would give the marching orders. So Clark Clifford lied. He told the Fed and other agencies, uh, you know, we swear under penalty of perjury, we will be totally independent of BCCI and its owner, Abadi. (laughs) But they're just taking straight up marching orders and uh, 
plenty of people have testified BCCI and First American money was totally interchangeable. And how did that uh, penalty of perjury go? Uh, he paid a fine. <laughs> <laughs> he paid a fine equal to like 0.1% of the depositor <laughs> money stolen. 0. 0.0001. I do like the jingle being like, First American, you can't put your deposits here. <laughs> Nothing shady in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> Um, but so the story of how BCCI collapses, and you know, we'll do that, and then we'll kind of talk about possible Jeffrey Epstein links. The story of how BCCI- if you're good, yes, yeah. yes, if you're good <laughs> for the ten dollar level, mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll talk about the Jeffrey Epstein links. But the story of how BCCI collapses is simple enough. There's a there's a U.S. Customs investigation um, uh, where customs agents in Florida infiltrate BCCI. They're investigating the Medellin cartel, and BCCI is so blatant in its money laundering that they do this investigation, Operation Sea Chase. And um, what happens is, you know, they nail BCCI, uh, sorry, they indict BCCI in 1988. But what happens is, and uh, multiple customs agents involved in this would resign. One of them saying in his letter uh, something to the effect of, I can no longer continue um, being an agent if this is how I am represented, if the people above me are misrepresenting the U.S. public this way. I'm, par- I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like that where he says, you know, the people above me are stamping out this investigation. Uh, remember, it's the kind of thing that makes the average citizen puke <laughs> and look at the system and say, yuck, you know, what's going on? You know, I will say this entire time I have not puked or said yuck. I've had a couple of yucks. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. guess we all have had a couple of yucks. That's <laughs> yeah. a fair point, Andy. When I heard the jingle. <laughs> um, but so- no, Nobody yucks for the jingle. Mm-hmm. Oh, guys, it's coming. <laughs> oh, 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 fuck. You can puke in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. Driving in America. <laughs> you can puke in your own car. It's your car. <laughs> Just like eight year old boys dancing to that jingle. <laughs> <laughs> On the peanut farm. Um, but look, what happens in Florida, and this is the. Oh, the peanut farm was too Florida. far for you? You made the joke about pedophilia, and then when it was on the peanut farm, you're like, oh, Jesus. Oh, no. Yeah. No, we can't be accusing Jimmy Carter. He didn't know what was happening. It wasn't him doing it, it was just he was on his farm. He was misled, for yeah. sure. He was like, look, I, I, I just don't even believe in it sexually, but in order to make the peanuts grow, you have to do this. Oh, my God. You have to do the child sacrifice. You know, the, the We've chi- done this for thousands of years, <laughs> harvested peanuts. Listen, this I way. could accept the child sex, but when it was for <laughs> agricultural reasons, that's where I drew the line. But so this Florida plea deal, 1988, uh, it's interesting. The way it's described is um, they indict you know, various members of the Medellin cartel. They indict a few lower-level BCCI bankers. Um, BCCI puts all the defendants up in condos. Uh, and they pay for Florida police to guard them in the condos instead of waiting in jail. And uh, the Outlaw Bank, the book, speculates, or I think very credibly, that the reason they did this is to prevent all of them from cutting plea deals. Because if these defendants had been allowed in jail, you know, either a lawyer or somebody in the courtroom would have said to them, yeah, you could plead out with the feds. Like, you don't have to do 20 years. Right, right. So they have these people be sacrificial lambs. Like, they get, you know, various sentences up to 20 years. You know, they talk about... Uh, the various wailing in Urdu in the courtroom when these sentences are read out. They clearly, these bankers didn't understand U.S. law or what was happening to them, and they had no idea they had the option to rat on anybody because BCCI <laughs> kept it from them. Oh, really? And so the U.S. Justice Department, which again, Robert Mueller is the, uh, Robert Mueller is the assistant attorney general. Mueller? Yeah. He uh, is the guy who goes out on television and says, we did everything possible here. But what actually happens is uh, the Justice Department settles for a $14 million fine, again, crippling. This is Sarah Kenzier from Gaslit Nation, and you're listening to Mueller, She Wrote. (laughs) Oh, we bad. Yeah. We did everything we could. (laughs) There's no conspiracy. So as part of this... um, We wrote the fucking jingle, guys. We tried. An investigator for John Kerry's Senate committee... 
Uh, he flies out to Florida and he interviews one of these BCCI bankers and he records this interview. And the BCCI banker tells him straight up, yes, First American is a front. We own it. We run it. And he also tells him they that they gave bribes to various politicians. They have, uh, you know, Clark Clifford is on their payroll, et cetera, et cetera. This is all in 1988. And then what happens is um, the Justice Department, under Robert Mueller, Assistant Attorney General, uh, <laughs> will tell the Kerry Committee and tell Manhattan DA Robert Morgenthau that they the tapes of this interview do not exist. They really? are not familiar this with is it. Sarah Kenzier from Gaslit Nation, <laughs> and you're listening to Mueller. She wrote. <laughs> best podcast out there man they will also uh refuse document requests from the carry committee refuse document requests from robert morgenthau say they don't have these documents uh you know all Blocking this other- on twitter for saying vietnam vets committed war crimes <laughs> all this other shit where they get this you know 14 million dollar fine some of the lower level bankers go to jail but they don't follow up on any of the allegations it's from 1988 to 1991 they're just not following up on this clark clifford bribery they're not following up on first american secretly owned all the other people Im- implicate it um and i guess you don't have to take our word you can listen to robert morgenthau uh respect it uh, former district attorney of Manhattan, uh, Democratic Party stalwart, was fired by Richard Nixon and became the most principled uh, district attorney in Manhattan history. But he says directly that the Department of Justice, under Robert Mueller, <laughs> blocked him and tried to cover up this investigation. <laughs> Oops. You can't bank as a... Informant. There were people on the tape whose identities and existence they wanted to keep secret. Assistant District Attorney John Moscow is Morgenthau's chief BCCI Moscow. investigator. But they told your office we'll right these back. tapes didn't exist. I know. And so that they, they were mistakenly trying to conceal the identity and the existence of these they lied. people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it was a, a Quite a considerable period of time where we were not getting any help or assistance from the Justice Department. Why? That's a question you've got to address them to them. Yeah, that was Robert Morgan. This is Sarah Kenzier from Gaslit Nation, and you're listening to Mueller She Wrote. <laughs> But, you know, so this kind of goes on from 88 to 91. But what happens is uh, uh, around 1990 or early 91, Robert Morgenthau, as district attorney of Manhattan, prepares an indictment of BCCI. Should be noted, his investigators said they believe they were being followed, photographed. Uh, BCCI certainly has a lot of power uh, in its own. Paparazzi. Yeah. Uh, So Robert Morgenthau and the Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve, say that they're going to indict BCCI for being uh, for secretly owning First American Bank and for lying about this. So they have to fly out to the Bank of England. The Bank of England knows they've done. Uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper was the auditor uh, that you know, like for example, in 1985, they certified BCCI's books without qualification <laughs> as being perfectly on the up and up. <laughs> and this is again 1978. The U.S. Comptroller of Currency is like this is a fraud, um, but. For whatever reason, at one point in, I think, 1990, PricewaterhouseCooper does an honest audit where they're like, we don't know how big the hole is. There's a giant hole in these books. Right. And then the Bank of England... And soon to be in our heads. The Bank of England and BCCI conspire together to cover this up because the Bank of England is talking to Sheikh uh, Zaid of the United Arab Emirates and trying to get him... They get him to put in like $2 billion or something. But it's they're... so cute how that island keeps doing imperialism. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. This island... That's the UK. Yeah, is helping people hide money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what we're. What do you have a problem with the UK, Yogi? Wait a second, guys. <laughs> not not the jolly old England. <laughs> they got the funny voices. They're good guys, right? Yes. You want more porridge? They're those guys. <laughs> Spanish Inquisition. Come on. Don't we love UK? Oh, that was Spain. <laughs> I was doing Monty Python, Andy. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that is. Oh, okay. Um, but so, you know, uh, Price Waterhouse Coop. So the Bank of England, they're worried this thing's going to go under and then UK depositors are going to get hosed because, of course, the Bank of England allowed BCCI to open and then P- 
people in the UK to put their money in. Right. So they're trying to convince the Sheikh to um, put more billions in to bail it out and then move it from London to UAE. Uh, but then the Americans fly out and are like, no, we're shutting this shit down. So then the uh, Bank of England has to seize it. Mo- uh, Morgenthau indicts it and it goes out of business. And then from 91 to 2017, there have been various lawsuits of various people trying to get the money back where nobody knows exactly how big the hole is. But usual estimates are about $15 billion went missing. Did anyone get any money back? Uh, so the liquidator claims that 75% of the money came back, but I, I'm very skeptical about that claim. Yeah, it seems high. I you think know. 75% of his money came back. Yes. <laughs> I think it's like 75% of the people who like have the connections to get their money back. Right, right. No, really, though, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not the like people in, I don't know where it was, like, Southeast Asia, shown right. at the beginning of the Frontline documentary, where they're like rioting and in Banglad- police or Bangladesh and police are like beating them down. I don't imagine those people got their life savings back. Right. So we've we talked about it a fair bit. BCCI was, and you know, like Jimmy Carter bears some responsibility for this. Where you talk about this is a, th- a third world bank that is challenging, you know, U.S. imperialism and all all, all this shit. Um, uh, so Not some a good chunk of it. He was the one that gave them the car blanche to be like they're a good bank. Right. I mean, the same vein of the Jay-Z qualifying the Barclay group for the stadium. Jimmy Carter was the reason why BCCI grew as exponentially as they did at one point. He was the face. Right. So migrant Pakistani workers in the Gulf states are putting their money in BCCI, uh, impoverished people in Bangladesh. And BCCI also had a secondary business where they would give loans to, you know, medium or small sized businesses throughout the third world where a lot of Western banks wouldn't touch them. So, you know, and and would also hold their deposits. So if you're getting a loan from somebody, you want to put your money there, you trust Mm -hmm. them. So you just have to imagine that the people who actually got their money back were not the desperately poor people who were uh, rioting to get their money back when this thing went under. Mm -hmm. Yeah, direct action doesn't work. (laughs) Uh, In no way, 75% is the number, dog. This don't make any sense. Maybe 69, Mm -hmm. but not 75. (laughs) Um, but you know, so, and then of course, uh, Abadi had a heart attack Abada. and he, he had a heart attack and later a stroke in either 88 or 89. He would say in interviews, oh, everything was running fine, but then I stepped away from it. <laughs> and then in like two years, it became a giant fraud. Uh, but he was, uh, he was indicted, but Pakistan protected him because he owned the entire government. So he died in 1995 under house arrest. And uh, there's lots of speculation, but nobody ever found his secret Swiss bank account. But, you know, hey, uh, definitely one of, <laughs> you know what, we, we don't always say billionaires are smart on this podcast, but you got to give him some credit. Who who got the government in his will? Um, <laughs> it's just the estate attorney, and uh, you get the uh, nation of Pakistan. That's right. Uh, you get the entire nation of Pakistan, Osama bin Laden. <laughs> All right, and so you know, I guess what we should mention here to kind of close out the at least the first BCCI part of the story is. Kamal Adham, we've talked about him a lot, head of Saudi intelligence from around 1965 to 79. Uh, he, of course, George H.W. Bush denies having ever met him, despite being the, se- the head of the CIA. Right. Um, but so, according to the book... I don't know anything about this man, except I've read bad stuff about him. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't like, you know, I don't like what I read about him. It is funny. I'm, I'm just now realizing, you know, how, like... In movies, each era, like the president mm-hmm. in movies, reflects the existing president. Right, right. And it, it it didn't hit me until I watched the Pelican Brief that like, oh yeah, whenever they would have like this dumb out of touch president in a movie, it was just modeled off of Reagan and Bush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, Kamal Adham, uh, partially in response to Bush's comments about not knowing him, gives this interview uh, to a a radio station in Cairo on January 5, 1992. And I'm just going to quote a little bit from it. This is from the book, The Outlaw Bank. He says, this bank, BCCI, is not any bank. It is a bank that owns 69 banks around the world in 69 countries. This is not very much appreciated by the big big powers who were somehow like guardians to the younger students in the school. They always, in the past, used to monitor what the third world used to do. For example, if you want to buy arms, they, the Western powers, know exactly how the deal is made. If you want to make a venture in atomic energy, which they don't want anybody to do, they monitored all that. Suddenly, a new vehicle appeared on the scene, which belonged to the third world, and the 
vehicle was spreading so fast that it had branches all over the world. This somehow made them feel that the third world, instead of using the vehicle they usually assign to us to use, have their own vehicle. So now the money came from the oil business, went, that, that came from the oil business, went to this vehicle instead of the banks of the Western world. If you look around in the banking world, you will see that most of the Arab banking organizations with international branches are being hit one after the other, and it cannot appear to be coincidental. I believe that some of this is intentionally done because of the new order does not allow anyone to have his own vehicles and to do with it as he wants. There are so many things that were done through the bank, BCCI, that are regarded by the third world as an achievement, like funding the Pakistani Atomic Energy Program. To the world, this is a dangerous game. The young people are playing, and they are not part of the nuclear bomb club. But for the Pakistanis, the ones, the one that helped them is a hero, since India has an atomic bomb, so why can't Pakistan? Whoa, whoa, what? <laughs> <laughs> this is the only way it can defend itself. And so... So his theory is that BCCI got taken down because they were edging up on the IMF's turf. Yeah. Yes. Because they're anti-imperialist. Yep. But <laughs> okay. So just like some This Im- is a really woke thing. Some important <laughs> things about this. He acknowledges in this radio interview, he's uh, I believe it's in Arabic, so it's not intended for the Western audience, but of course, you know, US intelligence services would be aware of this interview and him saying it. He acknowledges that BCCI got Pakistan the atomic bomb. And there's a lot of smoke about how exactly they did this, but it's very much, I think, credibly alleged they did this with help from French sources as well as possibly the CIA. And well, the fucking French are up to this yes. shit again. Those frog-eating fucks. Yeah, and possibly the CIA and the Americans. So, you know. Oh, that makes sense. Right. So, uh, and, you know, the, there, there have been so many different weapon systems that the U.S., in various capacities, passed along to BCCI that BCCI in turn resold to the um, Chinese. Oh, to, standard banking procedure. <laughs> yes, to uh, Saddam Hussein, um, to oh, the Soviets. It's worth pointing out that in the early 80s when China was lifting its sanctions on uh, Western-owned banks and whatnot, they uh-huh. were the, they're in there before, in before the Western banks. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, in the special economic zones. Yeah, there's various allegations that they might have uh, influenced Deng Xiaoping, either through straight-up bribery or uh, the usual protocol department (laughs) method, Mm. but uh, we don't have any hard evidence about that. But I guess what I wanted to point out here is Kamal Adam is not a stupid guy. He knows how the intelligence game is played, so he gives this interview to an Egyptian radio station after Bush denies knowing him and after he's been indicted in U.S. court, and he acknowledges that BCCI got Pakistan the bomb, which nobody had acknowledged publicly before then. So you have to imagine he's saying to the West and the CIA and the Mossad, like, I can't go down, I know too much. And he gets to die in 1999 of natural causes. But, you know, it is... To the back of the head. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It is just something where, if you wonder why this thing really stops in 1993 like even though the litigation is ongoing uh another weird case that comes which we'll talk about in just a second here is the uh united kingdom was trying to keep this report i believe it's called the sandstorm report on bcci classified all the way up to the year 2011 they fought for five years in court they fought declassification efforts and this this report revealed that bear stearns which just so happened to be employing one jeffrey epstein was a broker for BCCI. Um, So it is something where, if you wonder why uh, William Barr's Justice Department covered this up, and then later Bill Clinton, who's a major funder, had uh, BCCI links, if you wonder why they covered this up and why they didn't go too hard after the Saudi connection, it's because there is so much dirt on both sides of the aisle here that... Wait, William Barr, the current AG? Yes, who was also in 92, Bush Sr.'s last attorney general. Oh, this is his second rodeo? Yeah. Oh. He was the old age I'm as a well. moron. Okay. Yeah. They don't get rid of the fucking dirt that came in the first time around. Like barnacles, this shit stick around, son. <laughs> um, and then just a couple... Like barnacles. <laughs> you don't get rid of them. You gotta scrape them off with a fucking knife. <laughs> <laughs> a couple miscellaneous BCCI stories before we move on to, to Whitney Webster. We're doing a three-episode mar- uh, marathon and... <laughs> Yogi's getting in his mood. <laughs> Fucking starting to crack, son. <laughs> um, so just like a couple miscellaneous stories before we move on to the Whitney Webb, Jeffrey Epstein thing. Um, BCCI, uh, in the book The Outlaw Bank, they interview an arms dealer 
who was, uh, uh, I believe he was, rep- I forget who he was representing. They were trying to do an arms sale to the Belgians. Mm-hmm. And he said that BCCI was representing the an Italian arms dealer. Mm. And he says that in Belgium, a BCCI muscle, like a French guy, confronted him and said that he would be killed if he didn't drop out of this deal. <laughs> um, so it is something where BCCI, uh, their arms business was very much linked up with their black network and their, uh, let's say, security services, which were very much in the business of murder and uh, intimidation. Um, and I also just wanted to point out, uh, some people might know, there was an Italian bank called BNL, uh, uh, Banco Nacional del Levaro. BNL was uh, Saddam Hussein's U.S. banker, according to Common Dreams, uh, that from 1985 to 89, it could make over $4 billion in secret loans to Saddam uh, to Iraq to help it buy arms. Um, and it just so happens that uh, the uh, Kissinger <laughs> Associates and Henry <laughs> Kissinger... Uh, of course he shows up in this. Yeah, BNL was a client of Kissinger Associates, and Henry Kissinger was on the bank's international advisory board, along with uh, Brent Scro- uh, Scrocroft, who would become George Bush Sr.'s national security advisor. Uh, uh, Henry Kissinger was also in discussion with BCCI from 1986 to 1989 about taking on a relationship. And it's it's something it's mentioned in the Kerry report where Kissinger says, yeah, we never took any money from them. But it's also like... Okay, you were talking for them with them for three years. There's right. no way you didn't. But you know, of course, yeah, as Hirsch said, um, Kissinger lies like some people breathe. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally the only way banks make money is mm-hmm. by making money. <laughs> um, and if you talk to them for three years, you got some of their money. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, and and then the other part of that is, of course, um, you know. Uh, uh, he makes various referrals throughout this time, and Kissinger. Part of it is, you know, BCCI is indicted. I would in like ni- to uh, refer that I am to meet the dancing girls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, part of the uh, referral. Actually, the dancing boys. I am in a bit of a mood right now. Um, uh, I particularly enjoy the boys doing the robot. <laughs> <laughs> You can bank with us. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want them doing the safety dance. (laughs) They cannot dance if they want to. (laughs) They must dance because they have to. Leave your friends behind. (laughs) (laughs) We do not want witnesses. You know, it was like this with uh, Indonesia. The like song comes on. The like the MIDI keyboard. The ding 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 ding. ding, ding. (laughs) Turn it off. Turn it off. Um, you know, so uh, BCCI gets indicted in 88 and Kissinger makes the decision, oh, it's not good for my firm. Originally, uh, um, he sends a letter like advising them on how to uh, uh, respond to this public pressure. But later he um, uh, cuts ties. Like according to uh, New York Times, uh, one, a person in 88, a person from Kissinger Associates, writes to a, the head of BCCI's New York office saying, quote, I enjoyed lunch yesterday and even more your suggestion that BCCI might be interested in developing a relationship with Kissinger Associates. Uh, and he said, I am reluctant to be more specific, at least on paper, about the cons- kinds of consulting projects we undertake for clients, unquote. <laughs> um, so, you know. And for whatever re- and you know, after the indictment, uh, a, a rep from Kissinger Associates writes to a BCCI executive saying, I received a call today who informed me that Dr. Kissinger uh, recommends that a public relations offensive be made by us. In that context, he has suggested using a, uh, a Burson Marsteller, a highly reputable PR firm that has successfully dealt with the first Chicago crisis last year. So they're writing to BCCI after the indictment saying uh, Kissinger has a recommendation of <laughs> which PR firm to use. Right, right. But again, in 1989, uh, Kissinger Associates uh, distances themselves from BCCI and claims they never took any money from them, but it's like, no fucking way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess just other like weird stories. BCCI people have said that they controlled the government of Panama to an extensive uh, degree. This is, of course, Noriega, who was originally our friend, later overthrown by George H.W. Bush. There's a story of a guy who I believe writes to the Kerry Committee, the committee. I'm so glad that uh, Stephen Colbert cl- uh, made him fun and relatable by dancing with Henry Kissinger. 
the uh, really it, uh, speaks truth to power. So this uh, this letter is sent where um, a guy in Panama says he fears for his life, but he has BCCI documents uh, linked to the U.S. and Panama and Noriega. He travels to the U.S. Embassy, seals these documents, and sends them directly to the DEA, I believe in Florida. Can I guess what happens next? When the DEA... He dies of natural causes to the back of the head. (laughs) When the DEA receives the files, they have been opened and many of them are missing. He sends them (laughs) from the American Embassy to the DEA (laughs) and files go missing. Also, after the U.S. invasion of Panama, many files related to BCCI and Noriega also go missing. Because in addition to Cayman Islands, Panama is notorious for bank secrecy. So uh, BCCI, that became one of their major uh, world bases. Um, Yeah, and, you know, so... There's a million different stories you can tell about BCCI. The book The Outlaw Bank says Bob Gates, who is both Obama and Bush Jr.'s Secretary of Defense, secretly met with the head of BCCI, Abadi, in Hong Kong. Really? Uh, it's probably related to Iran-Contra. Um, th- there's also a story about $90 million in cash being shipped into Washington, D.C., and nobody having any idea where it ended up. What? Really? Yes. It. Uh, that seems like a... Regular occurrence, though. <laughs> yeah, so there was... Um, That's fucking nuts, man. 90 like, million, you said? Yes. Uh, yes, the, uh, the, the Black Network operative they were interviewing, he described how the bank moved $90 million in cash into, Washington, D- into the BCCI's Washington, D.C. office in the mid-1980s. Um, and uh, their intelligence source, Condor, says, my sources confirm this. Uh, so this is. Yeah. Oh yeah, Condor, you can trust his candor. In an eighteen month, in one eighteen month period, ninety two million dollars found its way to Washington. Cash in these amounts obviously isn't needed for normal commercial purposes, and they don't really have an answer for what that was used for. Whether it was espionage, stolen stolen secrets, stolen hardware, um, yeah. So ninety two million dollars in an eighteen month period in cold hard cash has moved into BCCI Washington, and nobody ever saw it again. So, you know, it's there's a million different threads that you can pull on that don't really lead anywhere. It's just <laughs> all mirrors. Carcosa. Yeah, that was the You in Carcosa now. <laughs> uh, another funny story is BCCI supplies the tanks for the Kuwaiti Victory Parade. Sean, I don't know if you, you keep saying these stories are funny, and I'll be honest, man, I ain't laughing at these stories. <laughs> None of these stories have been particularly funny, dog, unless it's supposed to be some sort of, like, dark humor Rita Rudner type of shit. Yeah, so Kuwait had no tanks, and, of course, uh, the U.S. and the Gulf War didn't want to look like imperialists, so even though this bank is, like, corrupt as shit and an arms dealer, they got them to supply Kuwait with tanks, and then they got them to (laughs) supply drivers for the tanks for the Kuwaiti Victory Parade so the Kuwaiti soldiers could sit on the tanks because they didn't know how to drive them (laughs) (laughs) and wave to the people. (laughs) Um, but I guess the last thing I'll say about BCCI is um, Bank of America in the uh, mid to late 80s sold their 30% stake uh, because they realized this was a corrupt operation. They didn't want to be nailed with it. But according to the book Outlaw Bank, Bank of America remained a silent partner for basically BCCI's entire life. I'm just quoting from the book. Five Bank of America senior officers were either on BCCI's board of directors or helped to manage the bank. For the next decade, the two banks would move billions of dollars a week through each other's international offices, and the Bank of America would be an invaluable, if hidden, ally since it would continue to accept BCCI's letter of credit business after virtually no other Western bank would touch it. We didn't really get into it, but letter of credit is... Uh, something in the international shipping trade where BCCI used this to smuggle weapons and people and everything else because you, in order to do international trade, a bank will guarantee a letter of credit that you will pay once goods are delivered. And then so they would do, uh, with arms sales, they would do fake letters of credit or with coffee smuggling, they would um, get coffees uh, from various non-treaty countries and, uh, you know, like there's humane coffee condition treaties at this time that they skirt by they say, oh, this shipment of coffee is going from one non-treaty co- country to another. And then they would say it has a layover in Florida and then it would get unloaded in Florida. And then BCCI officers would forge these uh, letters of credit to say, yeah, it, it was shipped to its destination and then it would just get sold in Florida. Um, so, you know, these letters of credit 
Uh, Bank of America is ta uh, taking these fraudulent letters of credit. Uh, indeed, it can be argued that Bank of America became the single most important financial institution helping BCCI stay afloat. In the United States alone, Bank of America transferred more than $1 billion a day for BCCI until the moment of BCCI's global seizure in July 1991. Um, and it was also a key uh, uh, partner in Abadi's deposit gathering scheme, where to keep the Ponzi going. He needs all these deposits. So Bank of America often directed people towards BCCI offices, <laughs> even if it didn't have an official presence. And it is just something where to kind of close out the BCCI part of this. None of these people had to give the money back. Right. <laughs> You know, Bank of America got to keep it. Bear Stearns was another BCCI broker. They eventually went under for other reasons. But so much fucking money was made off this scam, and really almost none of the principals have been held accountable. But I guess with the time we have left, we can talk about Jeffrey Epstein. We can talk a little bit. Hooray! About, <laughs> we can talk a little bit about the finally. Fi yeah, talk a little bit about the Finders cult. And I, I just want to talk about this uh, this write up in. Um, in Mint Press by Whitney Webb, who's one of the uh, main Jeffrey Epstein reporters out there. Um, she was the one who uh, uh, wrote about the Assad, or not Assad, Mossad connection yes. with Epstein. Um, so she writes about Adnan Khashoggi, uh, father of a murdered child. <laughs> uh, he was a, uh, quoting- Oh, he was Jamal's dad. Yeah. Okay. Adnan, yeah. Mm. Uh, well, he was also quoting- I wasn't sure if it was just like a coincidence. No. Uh, he was like a major Saudi who, uh, yeah, gave birth to Jamal Khashoggi, who was later killed by the current government of Saudi. I think you're burying in the lead that he gave birth. <laughs> uh, Adnan Khashoggi, quoting from Whitney Webb, Ad Adnan Khashoggi was a key figure and intermediary in the Iran-Contra scandal. He used one of BCCI's accounts to move more than $20 million related to illegal arms sales, and BCCI created... Fake documentation, including checks signed by Oliver North, allowing the sale to go <laughs> forward. The bank later, when its activities came under scrutiny, claimed it had no records of these transactions. Oliver North was just signing checks. <laughs> and he still got away with it. Yeah. Uh, according to, um, she quotes uh, a journalist who wrote, uh, named Vic Victor, Ostrovsky, who wrote a book, a number one New York Times bestseller called By Way of Deception, and he claims that Adnan Khashoggi had been recruited by the Mossad years before and that his private jet had been fitted in Israel. In relation to Iran-Contra, he claims that it was a $5 million bridge loan that Khashoggi provided that helped overcome the lack of trust between Israel and Iran during the initial arms deals in the early 1980s. So... She makes the allegation that Adnan Khashoggi was related to the Mossad. Vicki Ward, who's written extensively about Epstein, she did the first profile of Epstein, uh, the mysterious Mr. Epstein. Uh, she says... Where his uh, connections to children was uh, buried. Yes, by the editor. According to Vicki Ward, Adnan Khashoggi was a client of Jeffrey Epstein's in the early 1980s, not long after Jeffrey Epstein's departure from Bear Stearns in 1981. We've mentioned again that... Uh, uh, Bear Stearns was a broker for BCCI and that um, Jeffrey Epstein, his job at Bear Stearns ostensibly was to help people hide their money overseas. This is BCCI's bread and butter, Cayman mm -hmm. Islands, all this shit. So, you know, and we can kind of go through this here, though I guess we didn't even mention Bill Clinton was uh, the governor of Arkansas during Iran-Contra when the Mena Airport in Arkansas was one of the key smuggling routes where uh, in Arkansas, various Contras were trained. Cocaine was apparently shipped out of Arkansas by the CIA, weapons as well. Barry Seal was a CIA operative who also worked for the cartels, who was murdered, I believe, by the Median cartel, but very possibly um, the U.S. government made a decision to not protect him because he knew too much. Uh, but so that's kind of the Bill Clinton connection to Iran-Contra is he was government when a major part of Iran-Contra was being run out of his home state. And uh, yeah, so and so Vicky Ward claims that uh, Jeffrey Epstein, one of his clients, Adnan Khashoggi, was his client during the time he was running Iran-Contra. Right. And so you go from there to like, there's no way at least there's not a tertiary link between Jeffrey Epstein and either the Mossad or the CIA or both. Yeah. 
Do you guys see that graph commons of Jeffrey Epstein and everyone he's connected to? Uh, it, was on, it was on Reddit a few days ago. Oh, nice. But it's oh, literally man. just like a fucking nice. spider web orgy of the U.S. government fucking Jeffrey Epstein himself among several, several other fucking dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> the Bill Gates. Like, oh, I just, uh, I reached out to him because he knows a lot of rich people. Yeah, right. One of my favorite things is um, on our Glenn and Eva Dubin episode, at the end, I made a joke about Bill Gates being the master pedophile. <laughs> and then a, a month later, documentation comes out that Bill Gates is the master pedophile. That's what the show does, Sean. We don't realize it yet, but we're like Death Note, but of billionaires. <laughs> Doesn't always work out, but every now and then an episode comes out and it turns out, oh, wow, well, this fucking Adam yeah. Newman was certainly uh, under the spell. Or the cat, the cat that jumps up on the bed yes. of the pedophile exactly. at, the, at the old folks' house. We're Oscar. That's right. I know the cat's name. Nice. Right. So, you know, Epstein, one of his clients is Adnan Khashoggi. Well, Adnan Khashoggi is straight in the middle of the Iran-Contra deal for the Mossad and the CIA. Another connection that Whitney Webb paints is a guy named Douglas Lisi. He was an um, English arms, de- arms dealer that uh, Epstein knew very well. Um, he was involved in the, a series of arms sales between the UK and Saudi Arabia called the Al Yama deals, which means dove in Arabic. Oh. <laughs> so this is, you know, sending the nice. weapons used to murder in Yemen. <laughs> right, right. And the name is the dove deal. Um, yeah, it sounds like the peacekeeper, you know, apocalypse nuclear weapons. In um, in 1985, Margaret Thatcher signs the first of these. There would be two more. Uh, apparently, it's alleged, but it's never been proven that her son profited from this deal oh really uh in 2006 the uk serious fraud office was investigating alleged bribes to the saudis as mm-hmm. part of this deal we've talked about uh saudi commissions which are kind of indistinguishable from bribes being paid for all these arms deals uh the the serious fraud office in 2006 was investigating this but the blair government said it was not in the national interests and <laughs> bae systems raised fears that it was about to lose out on the third phase of the deal <laughs> if this bribery <laughs> investigation went forward yeah definitely not in the national interest um but the the important thing is that douglas lisi this guy, uh, according to Whitney Webb and other sources, Lisi is said to have spoken of Epstein's, quote, genius and lack of <laughs> morals, <laughs> emphasis on that part, when he introduced him to Steve Hoffenberg of Tower Financial. And soon after that introduction, Hoffenberg hired Epstein. We talked about on the first Epstein episode we did about Tower Financial being a giant Ponzi scheme that Epstein was involved in. Um, and then I guess like the last thing to mention here with regards to the CIA thing is Les Wexner and Southern Air Transport. You might be familiar with Air America. Air America was uh, the CIA front airline that was originally smuggling heroin out of Laos. Like at minimum, they were allowing heroin sales to fund guerrillas that backed their side in the horrific war in Laos that took place along with the wars, the wars in Vietnam and Cambodia. They were allowing heroin sales, if not... The most bombed country in the world, <laughs> which yeah. uh, is one of those weird facts where it's like, oh, who was bombing them? America was. Yeah, no one teaches you that, that more bombs were dropped on Laos than um, all the bomb, Or there was more explosive power dropped on Laos than uh, all of the bombs dropped in World War II, including the nuclear bombs. Jesus Christ, really? And for years, a thousand people would get killed up until a few years ago by uh, unexploded um, bombs just in the ground in Laos because it's just filled with them. Yeah, but if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have one of our favorite characters from King of the Hill. (laughs) Do you guys see that the the private chef of Epstein's opening a restaurant in San Francisco? Oh, good for him. Her. Oh, good for her. Uh, yeah. Could I get a dish without children's brains in it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so for dessert, we have adrenochrome. And for the appetizer, we have adrenochrome. <laughs> and for the main dish, we have adrenochrome. <laughs> but it's a really good adrenochrome for the main dish. <laughs> Uh, sorry, These we, are middle class kids, not like poor kids. Yeah, we're only open when the sundial is pointing in the pattern <laughs> specified by the protocols of Moloch. <laughs> um, so let's talk about Les Wexner. Les Wexner, of course, the Victoria's Secret billionaire, the only guy who conceivably 
uh, I shouldn't say the only guy, but the guy who gave Epstein the majority of his fortune, according to all public records. Right. Gave him a mansion in Manhattan for free. Gave him at least $250 million just in, like, stock transfers. And he was misled by uh, Epstein the whole time. <laughs> well, that was Victoria's Secret. So... <laughs> Air America was this CIA front airline. According to Whitney Webb, after 1973, the company was placed in private hands, although although all of its subsequent owners would have CIA times, including James Bastian, a former lawyer for the CIA, who owned, uh, it was renamed to Southern Air Transport from Air America. He owned SAT at the time of its relocation to uh, Ohio. That's got to be an easy job. Like, So what's all this about um, a massive international operation to rape children for blackmail? Oh, that's classified. No, I can't tell you anything. All right. I'll have another $100,000. Another day is the employee of the CIA. So SAT, Southern Air Transport. Must be a great break room, though. You know? <laughs> According to Whitney Webb, it was intimately involved in the Iran-Contra affair, having been used to funnel weapons and drugs to and from the Nicaraguan Contras under the guise of delivering, quote, humanitarian aid while also sending American weapons to Israel that were then sold to Iran in violation of U.S. arms embargoes. In 1986 alone, SAT transported from Texas to Israel 90 tons of tow anti-tank missiles, which were then sold to Iran by Israel and Mossad-linked into intermediaries like Saudi arms dealer Adnan Khashoggi. So... This is a CIA front airlines based out of Florida that Les Wexner and by this time Jeffrey Epstein is his financial manager by all accounts running his books, at least on the surface of things. They transport this airline to Ohio and it becomes a major intermediary for flights between Ohio and Hong Kong because this is what Les Wexner claims he needs for his business. Um, And we've mentioned... (laughs) Uh, yeah, so in 1995, uh, they get this airline, um, SAT, to relocate from uh, Florida, Miami, Florida, to Columbus, Ohio. Um, they get a whole bunch of tax credits from the local Ohio government to do this. Uh, Bob Fetrakis, <laughs> Bob Fetrakis, the uh, independent journalist uh, in the Ohio area, he noted that in addition to Les Wexner, the other main figures who were key in securing SAT's relocation to Ohio were Alan D. Fires Jr., a former chief of the CIA Central American Task Force, and retired Air Force Major General Richard Secord, head of air logistics for SAT. T's covert action in Laos between 1966 and 1968. Uh, Secord was also the air logistics coordinator in the illegal Contra resupply network for Oliver North during the Iran Contra. I can imagine the governor approving that deal where he's like signing it off and he's like, all right, we're going to run the international pedophile ring and that will show all the people who say that Ohio is boring. <laughs> uh, Fires was also one of the key people in Iran-Contra who was later pardoned by George H.W. Bush with the assistance <clears throat> of Attorney General Bill Barr. Uh, notably, it was during the same time that Epstein exerted substantial control over Wexner's finances, and according to Bob Fetrakis and his extensive reporting on Wexner from this period, it was Epstein who orchestrated logistics for Wexner's business operations, including the Limited. This is the uh, Bill Barr who is ne- who uh, swore to really get to the bottom of why the security cameras outside of Epstein's cell were destroyed. <laughs> yep, same one. Uh, in an exclusive interview, Bob Fetrakis told Mint Press that Epstein and Wexner's involvement with SAT's relocation to Ohio caused suspicion among some prominent state and local officials that the two were working with U.S. intelligence. Fetrakis specifically stated that then-Ohio Inspector General David uh, Strutz and then-Sheriff of Franklin County Earl Smith had personally told him that they believed that both Epstein and Wexner had ties to the CIA. This is in 1995. These Ohio state officials told Bob <laughs> <Wow>. Fetrakis that. <laughs> Governor's like, it's okay, this will help him make uncomfortable bras. <laughs> right, years right. From now. Yeah. right. And so years from now. interestingly enough, um Yeah, isn't that crazy how like now everything we know about Les Wexner and then Victoria's Secret still kind of chugging along like nothing happened? Of course. Because at any point business interest being compromised is what they care about most. Yeah. Like literally every terrible occurrence of Wexner could come out. But if Victoria's Secret bottom line isn't hurt, who gives a fuck? Yeah, it's it, it's just surreal, like, learning all this, and then, you know, you'll just see an ad uh, somewhere where it's, like, Victoria's Secret. And yeah. it's, you know, someone in a, like, angel 
you're wearing like angel wings and a bra and it's like oh yeah the the pedophile company one of the pedophile companies. <laughs> yeah. Let's not let's not single them out. Yeah, there's also Grubstakers LLC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bob Fitragus also told Mint Press that Struts had, uh, the um, uh, Inspector General of Ohio, had referred to SAT's route between Hong Kong and Columbus on behalf of Wexner's company, The Limited, as, quote, the Meyer Lansky run, as he believed that Wexner's association with SAT was related to his ties to elements of organized crime mm. that were connected to the Lansky-created National Crime Syndicate. In addition, Catherine Austin Fitz, the former investment banker and government official who, was extensively investigated, who has extensively investigated the intersection of organized crime, black market, Wall Street, and the government in the U.S. economy was told by an ex-CIA employee that Wexner was one of the five key managers of organized crime cash flows in the United States. We've talked about also Wexner's possible links to the murder of lawyer Arthur Shapiro the day before he was to testify about to the IRS about offshore tax havens used by the limited. He was the lawyer who had the limited account. For Les Wexner, he was shot twice in the head mob style. Unsolved murder. Sounds like a suicide. <laughs> but, I mean, it is something. Oh, yeah. And so this airline, SAT, that's it, run by the Wexner, uh, by Wexner and Epstein from 95 to 98. It declares bankruptcy in 1998, uh, conveniently just after it comes out that it was involved in the Iran-Contra scandal, that it was a CIA front during Iran-Contra. <laughs> so I guess it is something here where... Uh, you know, I, I guess we have teased that we're going to talk about the the finders and the Franklin credit scandal. I think we're already like near the amount of time that we have here, but we could just mention. I've looked into the Franklin credit scandal a bit. I, I I'm not sure. Is if that the one connected with the Vatican? Yeah, I can't remember. there's so many fucking pedophile scandals from the 80s, and and Whitney Webb has wrote about them, and I don't know how much they all link together, and how many of them are just like go down this rabbit hole and don't focus on BCCI and Epstein and shit. <laughs> right, you know? right. Um, but I guess we could just mention the finders here, and maybe we'll revisit the uh, uh, Franklin credit scandal in a future episode. Yeah, I mean, the the finders thing, it's... That one, it's hard to um, come up with much. Like, the main, uh, uh, the main issue was there were a couple of guys with a bunch of, like, very, uh, very suspiciously at a park with some children who were covered in bug bites, looked disheveled, malnourished, and uh, they got arrested um, for, you know, they, it looked like they'd kidnapped the kids. And when they were arrested, uh, they didn't give, or when when the police confronted them, they didn't give any uh, information as to uh, where the kids were from. They were very evasive with the police. And uh, the medical examiners who looked at the kids said that there was possibly signs of sexual assault. And these guys were traced back to this cult in Washington, D.C. called the Finders, who um, this is where things get murky because they were able to confirm that the kids, uh, the kids had said themselves, these were like really young kids that, oh, we're being weaned off of our mothers, hmm. which, you know, normal thing Oof. for a child to say. Well, they said like these men are our teachers. Yeah. Like, really? Yeah. And um, it turned out that when they actually traced that it back to their mothers in Washington D.C. that their mo- those were actually their mothers who were also in this cult, and it was kind of a a new age uh, weird thing where there was a guy called the Game Master mm-hmm. who uh, would give people directions to do all these uh, weird things like oh uh, leave here with no money and come back with a hundred dollars things like that. Mm-hmm. But they also found uh, go ahead, Steven. Yeah, so they're, the finders were run by this guy called Marion Petty. Mm. Um, and he was like a extremely charismatic, sort of unusual guy. He like he really believed in um, what he called natural living, which was like yeah, deprogramming, also. like not having your kids go through education, formal yeah. education of any type. Yeah. And just like allowing them to like organize amongst themselves and like you're just there to um enforce like some basic guidelines but otherwise they but, just but organizing themselves. is good right <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's trying to unionize the kids <laughs> uh and so marion had like a position called he was the game caller and 
like he would occasionally like all he would let on basically was that he would call different games for the kids hmm. and that they would that was basically was their education yeah yeah he was uh the dungeon master yeah it's very extremely vague in his account yeah um, and they they, what, al- they what, also found documents that detailed how to uh acquire children one of them was just like ways for impregnating women um this was part of a, uh, a raid that was carried out in 1987 yeah i think yeah there was like a raid by um uh metropolitan police for the dc area and i forget uh the other agency that was involved uh the agent from the customs yeah customs yeah so he was sent there and he made he wrote up a report of his findings from the raid or the, the warrant that was exercised on the finders colt's place and he found like a, a pretty sophisticated computer system where they it looked like they had like set up communications with a couple other uh bases of some type mm-hmm. and they were like had like a fairly sophisticated sort of logistics network and including some like last minute instructions on how to how to essentially move children around right, with, and evade right. police and like telling them to do that right away because of all this extra this added police attention from the earlier report that like like the way the way this this from this the arrest raid, in Florida, yeah, mm-hmm. the raid the raid came about based on the arrest in Florida, based on like, oh, there are these two guys, they're just like well dressed white yeah. men who are uh, near these shepherding kids around who look these like disheveled they, kids. Yeah, they haven't even eaten in days or something. Yeah, right. They were the kids would taken into custody and they like urinated on the floor and they couldn't speak English, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I bet they were instructed to do shit like that. I think they could speak English. Oh, but. they they just acted kind of feral, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they could speak English, yeah. So You're right, they could speak English, my bad. One of one of Marion Petty's followers, he ended up writing a book years and years later on like his experiences in the in the, the finders. And it's kinda like it's one of those books that like there there are other books based on former cult members experiences that are like uh unsanctioned sort of like by the whoever was like the right right the charismatic leader but this one seems like it kind of was so like hmm. i think it might be slightly a case of like an unreliable narrator right because it seemed to be sanctioned by petty hmm. and petty's wife was like cia right or what was the connection there she, yeah he, yeah she had like an office job with the cia huh yeah, and he bragged about how, like, you know, she told him all of the secrets and stuff. Hmm. It's So it's one of those things where I read that customs agent report, and then it ends with saying, uh, we were told this was a matter for intelligence and not to investigate any further. And yeah. then you go through his report, and it's horrifying. He goes into these different places, and, you know, there's, like, fucking pentagrams and shit and telex machines that are communicating with other offices in London and other places. And it's just one of those things where I like read it. I'm like, this has got to be fake. Right. It's just so <laughs> on the nose that I'm like, yes, the CIA put this here to keep me from researching more about Epstein and BCCI. Yeah, seriously. But it, it's it's very disturbing. And then I guess a bunch of documents related to this just got FOIA'd. The FBI just released them under Freedom of Information Act. Yeah, and those didn't really lead anywhere, which makes sense because if they're going to release some documents, like it's not going to have anything incriminating. Yeah, well, like there's like, a handwritten note in the documents that says this is not a CIA front. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> then, well, some written just, in 2019. <laughs> right, some of the docs are just redacted, like half. Yeah, yeah, there are large parts redacted yeah. too, and then other ones don't really talk about anything. Yeah, yeah. you know, because when there's nothing there, you you want to redact the entire thing. Yeah. But that's the other thing. It's like, well, if the CIA was leading you on wild goose chases, I'm sure they would make it look like they were hiding something. Yeah. And I have no idea which category the Finders cult falls into. But it is another thing. What was the BCCI connection that that or what led you to that? Because you base you were our um, uh, game master, where you <laughs> said, "Look into uh, the Finders." It was something where I started following BCCI to a bunch of different conspiracy websites. Mm-hmm. I didn't see a direct link with the Finders, but people would talk about BCCI, the Franklin Credit Scandal, and the Finders as all being linked because, you know, BCCI was, of course, involved in child trafficking, and BCCI was also a CIA front, or at least used extensively by the CIA. Mm-hmm. So it is something where um, 
I just kind of stumbled onto it from there, like various conspiracy podcasts talking about the finders. Mm -hmm. Um, But, I mean, it is something where the thing is they want you to waste your time, but they also want you to look crazy. Where I do believe that Jeffrey Epstein was at least, you know, utilized as an asset by Mossad and or the CIA. I mean, Um, if not both. Yes. Acosta stated that explicitly when he said he was told to back off because this was intelligence yeah like if that's not a smoking gun right then, right know. yeah and like the the weird so i guess overall from a high vantage point the weirdest thing with the finders to me anyway was that they weren't really properly investigated and just was just kind of like pushed under the rug yeah yeah despite all of these weird coincidences that right. together uh would constitute something that you should at least like enough to charge someone with like potentially child endangerment or something yeah yeah Yeah, at minimum and then like in the documents they released like i forget who it was said there were tunnels underneath i don't know if he's a reliable witness underneath like the this little school that they had set up well that seemed like a tangent the tunnel thing was that that directly related to the finders did they have that or was that a separate case that i I think, I think that, that was, was finders a, related or maybe it was separate. I mean the I document know. was, was another... in the finders but I don't know if it it was in but you know it's it's a it's all the related documents. There was another case of a school where they um a, an anonymous caller said that a, a a preschool or actually a daycare were right. were molesting kids and sexually abusing them. Hmm. And, and that was the one with the tunnel. Yeah, right. and they said there were tunnels underneath it, and they couldn't find anything during the official sort of investigation mm. with the court. But then years later, they had an archaeologist go in and see, like, okay, was there any evidence there was a tunnel? And he was like, yes, there was. Oh, really? Yeah. But it's the thing is, like, all this shit with the 80s where, look, I, I, I read the, the Wikipedia article for the Franklin scandal is so obviously written to be like this is a conspiracy there were multiple investigations nothing was found here and it's like okay fair enough you know i'm going to just trust that there's nothing there to the franklin scandal though listeners happy to to read your sources please send me more if uh if that's wrong but there's something that happens in the 80s what's called you know the satanic panic and the the child molestation panic and there also definitely was a pope who was murdered over uh right. trying to shut down the Vatican Bank right and we don't even have time to get into all the fucking catholic uh american catholic churches who were linked to various go agencies. back to episode 100 <laughs> on the Vatican various agencies of the US government and various fundraisers for uh democratic and republican politicians who've been caught up in like straight up child rape uh, and, and Gary Glitter. Let's yes. not forget about him. <laughs> but my point is here, the satanic panic and the dismissal that everything that happened in the 80s was a conspiracy theory, mass hysteria. Well, you have to imagine, like, it doesn't take a genius to imagine or a conspiracy person or a paranoid to think at some level this might have been pushed. This might have been, hey, shut the fuck up about BCCI, shut the fuck up about Epstein. Like, this is all just crazy. Like, you're nuts. And the Finders cult and uh, the Franklin credit scandal fall into that in, in terms of things that have been dismissed as part of the satanic panic. And I don't mm. know the truth of them, but I do think with regards to BCCI and Jeffrey Epstein, I think that's the truth. And then I don't know if these other things are just distractions or things that are there to make you waste your time and look crazy. Well, they I think could... Stephen and I uh, actually were able to confirm that the Finders uh, were part of a project to um, bring... Uh, the sixth king of hell, Lord Paimon, uh, back to life as he was brought into the wrong body. And uh, we support that because Paimon brings riches and Patreon subscribers. Uh, which project? Hmm? Which project? <laughs> uh, the, the Bring Back King Paimon project. We just we made the episode so long so people turn it off and then we do a satanic ritual at the end <laughs> where we sacrifice a child. <laughs> To payment. Yeah. So there's going to be a short pause here, <laughs> and then they'll be like, still listening. We have looked to the Northwest and called you in. We've corrected your first female body Ooh. and give you now this healthy male host. We reject the Trinity and pray devoutly to you, great payment. Give us your knowledge. Of all secret things, bring us honor, wealth, and good familiars. 
bind all men to our will as we have bound ourselves for now and ever to yours. The aristocrats. <laughs> and with that... <laughs> Wait, actually, sorry. I, I know we've gone a little long here, but I got one other thing I want to do. Real quick, from Whitney Rebs repo- Webb's reporting. Jackson- Look, if you have too many more things, I think there's going to be a murder-suicide by the back of the head. <laughs> yeah, I think so, Sean. And, I, and I'll be honest, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a couple of murder-suicides here tonight. <laughs> Jackson T. Stevens was one of Clinton's Bill Clinton's main fundraisers. The campaign, he uh, provided Clinton's first presidential campaign with a $3.5 million line of credit. Uh, just so happens, according to Whitney Webb, Jackson Stevens and other prominent members of the Stevens uh, family, um, BCCI was largely brought into the United States business community through the efforts of Jackson Stevens and Burt Lance, Carter's former budget director, who assisted with BCCI's acquisition of First American Bank. The law firm involved in the effort was Arkansas's Rose Law Firm, uh, where Hillary Rodham Clinton just so happened to be a partner. So if you are wondering perhaps why Bill Clinton did not investigate BCCI after taking over from George H.W. Bush, one of his main money people was one of the people who tried and made some money bringing BCCI into the United States. And one other thing I wanted to mention is uh, <laughs> Evelyn de Rothschild, Evelyn Ford. You know, I love having the support of real billionaires. Sorry about that. I had to turn the volume up for payment. One last thing I want to mention. Uh, Evelyn uh, uh, Lynn Forrester de Rothschild writes a letter to Bill Clinton in 1995. This is from the Clinton Library. You can look at it, where she says... Um, uh, 